All right, so you need a voltage, a current, a field, which is also voltage, a charge, which is per unit time is current. So you need, you need to convert it into some physical quantity, right? Some physical quantity here. And um, one way to do that is uh, everyone is given a battery or a supply voltage, right? So, so you get a V bat and if I put two switches, so let's call this switch uh, one, let's say, and let's call this switch two. And you can call this ground if you like, doesn't matter. Now let's say this is your output. And from a VLSI perspective, we always talk about uh, um, the capacitive load. Okay, some C load, but it does well could be a resistor, but you know, for CMOS, we'll go ask about, uh, talk about uh, capacitive load. So you have a VDD and ground. So the obvious choice is, uh, um, you know, if I want a zero, I want, uh, so if I want a zero, I'll represent that with just the reference voltage ground. If I want a one, I will represent it with the VDD. Obviously you can do the uh, other way around. You can make zero as VDD, one as, uh, ground but uh, this is obviously more intuitive right and obviously everyone has to come to a standard where everyone can agree otherwise communication would be a huge nightmare right you send a digital guy who i mean a digital design where he's assuming zeros are vtd and one is ground uh, you're spending half of your uh, design time trying to do translation so you have to come to a standard so this seems like a good standard so which means that, uh, so if I kind of draw it as a truth table, uh, then, uh, so let's say I have S1, S2, and uh, this is my output. Then I, if I want my output high, then my, I want my switch S1 to be on, sorry, on, and this should be off. And if I want my output to be zero or ground, then I want this to be off and this to be on. Um, <coughs> and obviously both on is no good because it'll shut my battery and blow it up in two seconds, so not allowed, right? Not allowed. Okay, so that's, that, that's one of the reasons. So if I can create like a field control, some control device, so I have some control voltage, let's say V1 and V2, so if I can control these two switches with some voltage or current or field or a charge or whatever uh, control physical parameter it is, then I have uh, a way to represent my digital abstraction uh, from this abstraction to a physical circuit, right? So that's the main motivation of trying to do these um, devices or switches, okay? Um, actually, you can do it one switch also, so maybe let's, let me ask this question first. So let's say if I give you one switch. So let's say I give you one switch, uh, which is, uh, I'll call that ground referred. What I mean by ground referred is, if this voltage is uh, high with respect to ground, it is on. If it is low with respect to ground, it is off. So I give you one switch and I give you one resistor. Okay. Um, how can you make that same digital gate? And let, <coughs> who can? So let's see. Let's wake somebody up here. How about Abhishek? How can you make a gate, a digital gate out of this? So I showed you with two switches, but can you make with one switch and a resistor? Okay, Abhishek. Car has gone to sleep. I guess there are two Abhisheks. How about Abhinab? Yes, sir. Sir, yeah. actually, I didn't understand the question. Okay. Uh, see, that's why we need to keep waking people up. You understood what I did in the left-hand side here? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You understood, right? What yes, I'm sir. saying is that I did it with two switches. Yes. Sir. I want the same circuit with one switch and one resistor. How do I do that? So what is the meaning of ground referred? 
Okay, so ground refer in the sense like uh, you don't need to, but it makes it life easier in the sense that if I, when I said, when I said the V2 is high, then S2 is high. But you could ask me with reference to what? It could be reference to this node. It could be reference to, uh, hold on a second. It could be reference to, you know, VDD. It could be reference to this node. It could be reference to ground. It'll be more clear when we're doing CMOS. Well, you know, why we need NMOS and a PMOS. Um, so when I mean by ground reference, I, I, I just simply mean that uh, this switch here, this switch here, this V. Okay, so if I write, so let's say this is some switch S1, then if I want to write the functionality of this switch S1, so when V is VDD, this switch is on. When V is zero, this switch is off. That's all it means, okay? And this VDD is with reference to ground. Zero is obviously reference to with ground. Now I could obviously make it such that this is zero, this is VDD, a voltage, and when this is zero, this is on. So then I would call this as VDD reference in the sense when it is VDD, I make the switch off. And when it is ground with reference to VDD, it is actually minus VDD, so it is on, okay? So that's what it means. So this means with respect to ground, and this is with respect to VDD. That's all it means. But this voltage is obviously with reference to ground. Okay, so how do I how do I make this switch with just a resistor and a switch? So Abhinav, can you did you understand the question now? Yes, sir. Okay, so can you tell me how I can make this switch now? The one so the so basically what I'm trying to make is this digital abstraction. So basically, I want to represent one and zero by controlling this switch. How do I do it? So when, and I'll tell you, so I want basically from this network, whenever there is a zero uh, representation, I want the output to be ground, right? Just like this circuit. And when I want to represent a one, the output should be VDD. So what should I do between VDD and ground? What should I do to, to get this circuit to do that? And my control voltage is this, this control voltage, let's say VC. So I give you two elements, one resistor, one switch, and I give you obviously battery with a VDD and ground. How are you going to make it? Any idea? So can we connect them in parallel? Yes, sir. Can we connect them in parallel? What do you want to connect them in parallel? So the switch, switch in parallel with resistor. Okay, so let's uh, pick one. So Chandan, yeah, go ahead. What what? How, how, how do I make the connection? Go ahead, tell me. So where do I connect the switch? So switch has three terminals, right? So let's say this is terminal T1, this is T2, and this is VC. So how do I connect? Tell me. So I have VDD, and obviously I, I have three terminals. I have a V control as well. So let's say I call it VI. So I have VI, V out. I have these four terminals. How do I connect this network to get the functionality I'm looking for? So Chandan, go ahead. How do I get it? So I need time, sir. Okay. Somebody was just telling me, okay, Subham, you've raised your hand. How do I do it? Sir, we took a T1 and... Okay, your voice is breaking up. And, uh... Your voice is completely breaking up. Go ahead, uh, say, say again, let's try. You need to get your connection. Sir, we, sir we will connect T1 to VDD and the register to T2. Okay, so first with S1. So who was that, Gautam? Or who, who is speaking right now? Sir, me, okay. sir, sir, we have to make a series con uh, connection between the switch and uh, the Okay, first tell, tell me how to connect the S1. Sir, we will connect the uh, T1 terminal of S1 to VDD and uh, register to T2. T1 terminal to VDD and then T2 to what? Uh, T2 to the register. And where is the register connected? Okay, so register ground. one end is here and the other one is ground. ground. Okay, all right. So, and where do I connect this node? V out, where do I connect it? 
sir uh, we out uh, in between that here yes sir okay and where do and i connect v1 v1 with the vc that switch uh, okay so this connects to vc okay so let's see if it works uh, the way i wanted it so when vi is ground i said the switch is off so the switch is off uh, what happens to the output is zero ground zero. Is, yeah but i want one okay so this doesn't work but you're on the right track so who else can the register should be connected with the bdd and d1 we will connect rl uh, to it and then we will connect it to the trans okay so rl to vdd and where's the other node uh, who is this uh, shatabdi i think yes sir okay vdd where is the other one where do i connect the other one switch to the end of switch to the switch one end of the switch where does the other end of the switch go to ground ground okay and the control voltage of the switch to bi to bi good okay and then yeah. vdd between okay connected between okay let's see if this works all right let's see somebody can explain this who can who can explain this if this works about uh, so, yeah so when the switch is off then vdd will pass through r and the output will be vdd and when the switch is off the vdd will directly be shorted with the ground so zero will be there okay so uh, so i forget so sorry who was this again sir so uh, when the switch is off no no just tell your name sorry i can't see who is speaking Punyadip. here Pun punyadip okay punyadip okay punyadip so he said when okay so but my first thing was when this is uh, when v is equal to 0 i want the output to be zero right when v equals to vdd then the output should be vdd i'm so uh, okay i think i made a mistake in asking for the spec so i wanted actually the inverter just like here so i went when v equals to 0 i wanted the output to be vdd and when v equals to input it, i want this to be zero sorry i wanted a inverter i think i asked you for a buffer but i actually wanted a inverter okay so when vi is equal to 1 which is vdd what happens the switch is on on is a short right yes sir it'll it'll discharge this to zero right yes sir. and the output is zero so that's this yes, condition here and then when v equals to 0 then this switch is off right yes yes sir and the resistor will charge this capacitor to vdd vdd yes okay so that will be 1 so when my input is 0 the output is 1 when the input is 1 from abstraction point of view the output is 0 right so that's my realization of inverter right now who can tell me what's the big difference between this circuit if i can do it just one switch and a resistor why would i need two switches like here with this functionality what is the big difference between this and this Sir? one here yep but can you please explain this again okay so if you see the functionality of this this network i did here what was the functionality is that when the s1 is on and s2 is off the output is vdd right which i was representing it as a 1 right when s1 is off and s2 is on the output is 0 which was obviously represented as a 0 now typically if i let's say i want to do a inverter then i would say okay when the input is 0 i so let's say there was a control voltage vc if the input was 0 i want this condition right if the input is 1 i want this condition so essentially what i've done is a inverter but i had two switches so what i had asked was if i instead of two switches i give you this switch in this case it's the s2 and i give you a resistor can you actually realize the same function 
Okay. Everyone got this question, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Any question on the question itself? Like what, what I was trying to do? <laughs> I think it'll be more clear when we do n must be must, but I was trying to see if you guys can think about doing the same functionality with just one switch and a resistor. So the resistor will dissipate more power in comparison to two switches. Okay. Well, first let me get to, I think, uh, so Satabdi, I think you asked like, how is this functioning, right? So let me, let me explain that again. So, so you had a resistor and you had a switch. This was ground. This was VDD. And so somebody connected this to the V output. And this was connected. Um, actually, let me start with a blank slide here. So, so you had a resistor, a switch. This was ground. And you had a control voltage. We connected that to VI. This was V out. And we'd say typically we want a capacitive load. This was R, right? And this was VDD. So what I wanted as a truth table was that when VI is equal to VDD, I want the output V out to be zero. When the input is zero, I want the output to be VDD. So that's like a inverter transfer function. So if I write it in a digital abstraction, when this is zero, the input is out one. When the input is one, the output is zero, right? So the question is, let's see if this is how it is functioning. Um, if you and I said, if VI is equal to VDD, then the switch is on, right? So let's say this is S1, S1 is on, okay? So let's take this first condition, VDD, VI equals to VDD, switch is on. So this is a short, right? If this is a short, then what will be this voltage? V out, it'll be ground, right? zero volts so that's sir, what i wanted yeah so nothing is visible on the screen oh you can't see the shared screen no sir uh everybody or just you sir i don't know but yes, sir, we, can see. we can see sir we can it's see. only yes, showing the white page sir. Sir, we can see okay can you see my drawing on the white page or not no Everyone? no yes, sir. sir yes sir, yes, sir. Yes, yes, sir. Sir. yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It is seen. Uh, okay, so half saying yes, half saying no. So, okay, let me see. Let me switch to this. Can everyone see this? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, so there's probably something on the client side which you need to switch. Okay, I'll just draw it here. It's easy for me to do it that way, but I'll just draw it here one second. Okay, so let me just continue with this one here. So if the switch is on, then this is a short, right? So the output is output is zero, and that's what I wanted, right? When input is zero, the output should be one, which is VDD. And when the input is zero, which means I said this switch is off, then this resistor will actually uh, charge this capacitor through the VDD and output will be VDD. And that's exactly what I had asked for, right? So is that is that clear now, Satabdi, or not? Yes, sir, although I haven't asked about this, but yes, I did. Okay, so sorry, what, what was it you're asking? What was the question? I asked this Sir, I wasn't asking. Sir, I was asking this. Oh, okay, sorry, Prachita was asking. No, sir, why. Himadri. Oh, Himadri, sorry, go ahead. What was the question? Sir, Same. I was asking the functionality, yes. Sir. Okay, now you understand Himadri? Yes, sir. Okay, good. All right, so, uh, and then I asked a follow-up question, what's the big difference between this and this? Let's see. Um, Okay, maybe I'll ask uh, Himadri if you if you can tell me what is the difference, big difference between this circuit here and this this circuit here, which I did before. What do you think is the the, the big difference? If I can at, at, attend the same functionality, do you think there is any 
issue with uh, either one of them or one has an advantage over the other or not? Okay, I'll give you a hint. In this particular expression, either one of them is on, right? So either yes. the VDD is connected to the capacitor or the ground is connected to the capacitor, right? Yes. So at steady state, you don't, you never have a path from VDD to ground. Is that the case with uh, this particular case here? No, sir. Okay, which case? So in this case, for example, the ch it is charged to VDD. There's no current flowing here, so that's fine. Which case uh, it is different? How about this case? The case where the switch is on. This is zero, but what about this current from VDD? Who can tell me what the current is from VDD? VDD by R. VDD by R. VDD by R. Right, so this current here is VDD over R. So which means when the output is zero, you actually always have this current flowing and this is your power consumed, right? So you always have that power consumed when the output is zero. When the output is one, it doesn't consume anything, okay? So that's a big difference between this and this. In fact, the first inverter or the gates which were created, that time we did not have CMOS. We only had NMOS, which was like this, what I have been calling as a ground referred switch. And that's how they made gates, but uh, obviously they were much power hungry. So one of the main motivation of CMOS, doing it this complementary, what's called the complementary switching, either S1 or only S2 is on, was to avoid this, what's called the static power. So when there is no switching going on, ideally you don't want to consume any power at all, right? Only charging and discharging is cap. So that's the only thing you want to have from a power perspective. Okay, everyone clear about this? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Good. So, um, so that was our motivation behind um, uh, doing this sort of this three terminal or four terminal device, so that we can actually convert this digital abstraction into a real ones and zeros. Right. So that's the that's the main goal for this. Okay. Now, um, like as I said before, we start talking about um, uh, the MOS, uh, the MOS switch, the working of a MOS switch uh, or a MOS uh, device. Uh, I just want to quickly sh go through some of the effects. Like uh, I want to show you the electric field effect in different in different material. Okay, so let's first see um, with the dielectric. So let's. Uh, switch to so in a dielectric so i'm going to have one metal plate on one side okay and i'll put some dielectric so this is some oxide let's say silicon oxide and then another metal plate here so so it's not visible again yes sir how about now Yes, sir. Uh, it's only showing in the this page is visible, but uh, when you switch over to next page, then it's uh, if you're writing anything, then it's not visible. Only the blank page is there. So you can't see anything on this page. Yes, sir. This page I can see, but this page I cannot see anything. Only the blank page. Visible. Visible, sir. So why is this happening? Oh, hold on a second. I'm not sure why this is happening. Hold on, let me start. Yeah, it is a visible page. All right, let me try again. Okay, how about now? So is it Himadri you're not able to see or who is this, Satabdi or Himad? Sure, sir, shall I leave the group and again join? No, Himadri, sir. Um, how about now? Can you see now? 
sir i i am only able to see the white page just that only okay how about now yes yes okay i'm drawing something now just scribbling something can you see no that's strange <laughs> okay yeah just try and everyone else is able to see right yes sir yes sir yes sir okay so himadri yeah yes, just sir. join again that's uh, that's really strange i don't know why that's happening on your side that's really strange so yeah just try to join again okay we'll just wait for her to join again one second sir yep uh sir can we connect a switch and the resistance in parallel and then the take the output actually resistance uh switch and resistor in parallel you mean like this and then do what then where is vdd and uh, okay what's what's the output where is the output what is the ground sir output is resistance and vdd is connected through the line of uh, output so can i unmute on the screen yeah go ahead Are you drawing? Yes, sir. But I can't see now. Hello, sir. Yeah. Uh, so could you please repeat to what you asked? I lost the uh, internet connectivity for two or three minutes. Okay. So which part do you want to re uh, repeat? Oh, hold on a second. This is Subham is drawing so something. So this question. Like You mean the previous switch question, or which question do you want me to repeat? Uh, no, no, this one, this one, this uh, present uh, screen. What is uh, he doing? Yeah, he's he's showing a circuit. I still don't know what the circuit is. Okay, go ahead, draw. Uh, Subham, draw it. Sir, is it visible? Yes, it is visible. So, okay, let me try to draw it uh, just so that. So, basically, you're saying do this, this. I guess you've drawn it the other way around, but it's the same. Is that what you've drawn, Subham? Subham. Yes. Can... Yes. Sir. Okay, that's a huge problem here. What is the problem? U is always equals to VDD. Output yeah, so is VDD. Output is always equal to VDD, no matter what you draw here. You just shorted. You've taken VDD and shorted to VA. So this one is immaterial. Not only that, once I switch on this, it shorts the VDD to ground. If I have a battery, that battery, if it's a lithium battery, it will blow. There will be literally an explosion. <laughs> you, you see what I'm saying, right, Subham? Yes, sir. Okay, so yeah, so the resistor it's called a pull-up network. So you instead of using another switch as a uh, pull-up, you actually use the resistor as a pull-up. But the problem is when you pull down, you actually draw some current from VDD. Okay. Okay, so Prachita, was that your question? Like what we were trying to draw here? So he was trying to show an alternative one. Okay. Okay, sir. Okay. Right. So uh, what I'm going to show is uh, um, I'll show you some uh, what the electric field like. If you apply a voltage across a dielectric or a resistive material or a semiconductor, what kind of behavior we get? Okay. So it's very crit critical to understand that because uh, that's what you know all your device workings are. If you have a resistor, you're always applying a voltage, which is an electric field. If it's a capacitor, you're applying a voltage, which is an electric field inside it. Yeah, if it's a semiconductor, you're applying a voltage. It is, or if you're applying a current, then you get a voltage across it. So they are interchangeable, right? So they're reciprocal in nature. 
So if I have, so I have basically here, I have a metal, I have an oxide, I have a metal, or you can, some people call it insulator. So mom or a mem, and then I apply a voltage across it, right? So let's say this is the voltage across it. So for a capacitor, uh, obviously once you apply a voltage for it, you, depending on the value of the capacitor, so let's say, uh, this uh, the area of some A, and uh, so that's your capacitor, so kind of a 3D version of it. And so let's say the unit capacitance was some C aux, which is what? Epsilon aux over, let's call this length L, or I'll call this T aux, thickness of the oxide. Right, so your unit capacitance is this over T ox, and so obviously your C total is the area times epsilon ox over T ox, right? So if you have this, uh, then you apply a voltage, some voltage V, and then obviously there will be no current through it, so you'll have charges, positive charges on this side, which will generate electric field. Now, when you generate an electric field in oxide, it has nowhere to end till it finds a free charge or an ion and it's a charge. So it'll keep traveling through the dielectric till it reaches the other side of the metal plate. Other side of the metal plate has plenty of electrons, so it'll, it'll end there. And then it'll end here. Another field will end here and so on, right? So what you see is it's, you see a constant electric field. So if I draw, the in the x direction here if i draw the electric field it's constant electric field from this node to this node and this is the derivative of the change of voltage with respect to x and if it is constant if the voltage is linear in nature then this is nothing but v over t ox okay and if i look at uh, the potential within that oxide, the voltage. Um, so let's call this V ox, let's say. So, so this is V ox over T ox. Okay, so how is the potential going to look like? Who can, who can say this? Okay, there's only a few people asking, so let me ask. So Rajkumar, can you tell me how the potential is going to look like from this distance zero till this T ox? So straight line uh, from origin. Straight line. Straight line. Passing through origin. Okay. Sir, sir, V2 decreasing at a Maximum okay, straight line or V2 to zero. zero to zero. Okay, yes. So, so this is case one, this is case two. So, let me ask somebody, Pritham. Okay, what's which one is true, case one or case two? Uh, sir, case one, case one. Okay, somebody says case one. Sir, Pritham, Pritham, sir, case one. Okay, so Pritham says case one. Uh, how case, about... Case two, exponential decreasing. So case two. So case, case two. Case two. Case two, sir, case two. Case two, case two, sir. There is exponential decreasing here. Somebody says that. Okay, <laughs> now my case. question is, my question is how do you verify which is right, which is wrong? E equals to minus dv by dv. V equal to minus e dx. Yeah, e equals to minus dv over dx, right? Yes, sir. V, yes, sir. So dv equals to minus e dx. Yeah. So, so is, then if that's the case, because I've shown you that the electric field is constant, this is this. So is the case one going to work? No, sir. No, no sir. sir. No, sir. <laughs> no, right? Because if this is no, the voltage, then if I take the derivative of that, that is zero. So it should be zero. So that, that will not work. Okay. Will case three work? No. No, because if I take the derivative of exponential, it is exponential. So it should do this. 
So that's that will also not work. So it has to be linearly decreasing, right? Yes, so that's sir. obviously from an equation perspective, but you should intuitively should know right away that it is not working. One case, this case, this voltage is zero right here. Obviously this yes, is sir. not working because you've shown V is equal to VDD here. It cannot be VDD here. It is, I've shown you that's zero at this node, right? So one side of the voltage is zero, one side of the voltage is VDD or V aux. So that those two are given, you cannot change that, right? So the question is, how do you get from here to here? So this is obviously wrong. And this one, you know it has to be because my electric field has to be constant. It's not changing anywhere. If it changes here, I need a charge here. But there's no charge. You cannot have charge inside a dielectric, right? If I have a charge here, then it can dip or do whatever it is, like in a PN junction. Okay, so everyone clear about this? So in a dielectric, the electric field is constant and the potential is changing linearly. Okay, so, let me, so this is constant, the electric field and the potential is decreasing linearly. Is that clear to everyone? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, any any questions here? All right, so no, sir. I think, okay, so I think the capacitor is clear now, right? So you have a dielectric in between. It can be air, silicon dioxide, polyamide, whatever it is. You apply a voltage, the electric field is constant with this voltage and, uh, and you have a linearly varying electric uh, potential in between it, okay? Okay, let me ask a question now. If I increase this area, so this was the area of the capacitor plate. I increase this area to 2A. So this is obviously 2A. What's the electric field? So let's say previously this electric field was E1. What is going to be the new electric field? Let me ask, uh, let's see who's been sitting quiet. Devashree, how's, what's the electric field going to be for the second case? So let's do this in green here. So can you repeat the question again? Okay, so the question is, I started with a area of the capacitor, right? Some area, W times L. I have two capacitor plates of area A. I applied a voltage V aux and I got some uh, electric field, which is constant throughout the dielectric and it's E1, okay? Some value U1, which was given by this value, V aux over T aux, right? Now what I'm going to do is change the area to twice, two times. So new area, new A new is equal to two times the previous area. My question is, if I draw the electric field again through the thing, what will be how many times of E1, the previous value of the electric field? Who can say? So there was three. Did, did, did the question make sense now? Yes, sir. Okay, so what do you think the electric field should be? Okay, how about Abhishek? Abhishek? Or how what is the electric field going to be? New electric field. So it will, so it will decrease, sir. It will decrease by how much? So E1 by 2, I think. E1 by 2. Okay. E1 by 2. And constant, right? All the way or not? Okay, I'll consider that as a yes. So E1 by two, okay, let's see. Aniket, what do you think? What should be the value of the field? It's a half of E1. Half of E1, so Aniket two. So I got one vote, two votes here. Okay, let's see who else. Shirag, what's the, what's the new electric field? taking time. What's that? So taking time, so a little bit. Okay, taking time. That's okay. Okay, how about? Uh, uh, electric field will be E, E1. 
Okay, who is this? Is Sitis? Yes, sir. Uh, Sitis, okay. So Sitis says it's going to be E1. Yes, sir. Okay. Sir, electric field will be E1. Sir, it's same. So it will be same. It will be the same. Uniform, okay. elec uniform electric field E1. Yes. Uniform electric field E1. Okay. And why is that the case? Why should it be still the same? I've increased the area by twice. Why is the electric field still the same? Because sir, electric field doesn't depend upon area. Sir, because electric field equal to dV by dx and V is still V O X and X is the same. That's correct. Your electric field is dV over dx. This is still V ox and dx is still T O X. So that's not changing. Okay, now tell me. So who's the... Uh, let's see. Dinesh. So if everything remained the same, I increased the area by 2x, something must have changed. What changed? No physical quantity changed or something changed? Capacitance. Capacitance. Total capacitance changed. Capacitance. Okay, okay. So how much will the capacitance increase by? Two times the previous value, right? Yes. yes. So when the capacitance increases, what increases then? Charge increases. Charge increases. Charge increases. So Q nu will be again two times the Q old. Yes, sir. Okay. So everyone understands this. So the electric field doesn't change. Like Siti uh, said, uh, your uh, potential across is same. Your distance is the same. Your electric field is not changing. You just increase the amount of electric field, but the strength of the electric field is still the same. Okay. So if you have increased the amount of electric field, that means you've increased the amount of charge basically. Okay. Everyone clear with this one? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. So next one we want to see is the effect of electric field on a semiconductor or even a resistive material. Okay, so let's take a, uh, and this will be like a precursor to when we do our IV characteristics of the MOS transistor, so pay attention. Okay, so I take a block of uh, resistive material or semiconductor And I apply a voltage across this. Okay. And so this is, so just to kind of get you guys acquainted with the MOS terminologies, I'll call this L. And I'll call this W. And this is some height. Right, and apply some V. Uh, so I'll call this VR, let's say, across this material. Okay, so let's do the same exercise now. Now, if I plot the electric field, what does the electric field inside this resistive material or a semiconductor? So let's say a semiconductor. So this is an N type. N type semiconductor, so which means I have doped it with some 10 to the power 15, like let's say phosphorus atoms per centimeter cube, so on. So, so it has a lot of um, uh, carriers in them to conduct, but how does the field look like inside it? And how does the potential look like inside it? So this is V. All right, let's see. Okay, let's see who can answer this. Sachin, what do you think will be the electric field inside this. Let's assume low electric field, uniform 
end type material what should it look like sir electric field will be a constant sir it will be okay. same as the previous case okay electric field he says is constant same as the dielectric okay let's see saurabh what do you think that's correct or or is it different is the electric field inside a resistive or n type same or as a dielectric or different same sir same okay so now can you tell me intuitively why it is the same because with dielectric you know the electric field when you go it doesn't find charge right when i said but there are plenty of charges here why is it still the same you know when i said inside electric field like with this one you know you have a block of dielectric and i applied a voltage difference v this is zero so i have a charge i have electric field but it cannot find another charge to terminate till it gets here but uh, sorry this one has plenty of charges right so let's say if i've done 10 to the power 15 so i have basically 10 to the power 15 electrons per centimeter cube plenty of charge why is it not why is it not able to why is the electric field keep just going is this constant throughout what do you think is the reason mobility sir maybe due to the mobility what do you mean by mobility okay smriti rekha can you tell me why the electric field is still constant although there are free carriers in them mm. no sir Okay, from a circuit perspective, I'll give sir. a hint. Yeah, go ahead. Who is this? Sir, uh, the potential uh, gradient is same. Potential gradient is same. It's okay, constant. how how is that? How is that? How do you say the potential gradient is same? Sir, give me a, like a more intuitive uh, understanding of it. Sir, because dV by dx is constant, so electric field will not change. No, no, but why is dV by dx constant? That's what I'm asking. So basically, you're doing one or the other. You said it's con e is constant, and when I say why, you said dV over dx. But I'm asking either one of them. Why is it true? See, in case of a electric field, it was the intuitively it, it did make sense because any electric field from a positive charge, it cannot, it just doesn't find a charge here, so it just ends here. That means it's constant. So this is, I know that this is true in a dielectric, but in a in a resistive material i am not sure because there's plenty electrons here why is this uh, electric field constant but you say oh that's because dv over dx is same that means the potential is linear but why is the potential linear you know you're right but why you know intuitively let's say you didn't know anything about material how would you from a circuit perspective how would you prove it Oh, it was a homogeneous material so it's a very homogeneous material in the sense that it looks exactly the same the entire volume of this material looks exactly the same see this whole thing looks like a resistor right so if i just yes. kind of draw it from here it looks like a giant resistor right yes sir correct yes sir. everyone and one side of the resistor is what voltage yes sir what is it no not yes sir i'm asking a question what is it vr vr with respect to ground which is ground, this ground. node right this yes, is zero sir. so i have vr on one side zero on one side so the question is why is it linear well one way to look at it is if i split this into many resistors so let's split it into four resistors let's say right yes so this is still vr this is zero. zero so if this was let's say resistance r this should be r by 4 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 right now let's look at the potential so obviously i start like i said before vr right yes sir i start with vr and I have to end here at what? Zero. Zero. Okay. 
what's the voltage here at t ox so this would be at t ox by 4 t ox yeah. by 4 what is the what is the voltage vr by 4 3 3 3 vr by 4 Correct. Three, three by, by, four, by yes, four, right? Three by four. I'll just write three by four. What's this? What's here at the ox by two? We are by two. We are by two. We are by two. Because it's because this is r by two. This is r by two. So it should be half, right? It's half here. Sorry. And then what is it at t uh, ox three by four? We are by, yeah. we are by four. We are, we are by, by four. four. Four, and then obviously here zero. So obviously that's linear, right? Yes. Sir. If yes, this sir. is linear, then the electric field is constant, obviously, right? Yes. Sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. okay. Everyone agrees with this or not? You have to have to understand this. Everyone. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, anyone, please raise your hand right now if you don't understand, because I'm asking, going to ask randomly question. So please raise your hand if you don't understand this right now. Okay, there was three. Go ahead, What's, what, so why, which part didn't you understand, there was three? Sir, can you just explain that graph plotting thing? Yeah, so basically what I'm saying is that in case of a dielectric before, I applied a voltage VR here, or in that case, it was some Vox, and this side was zero. Everything is referenced to one side, which I call it ground. And there, the electric field I knew was constant just from the physical principle, in the sense that because the dry electric doesn't have any free charge, right, in this case, because, you know, a dielectric material, like if you have a dielectric material, it only has dipoles, there's no free charge. So if I have a charge, see, if I have a charge, electric field starts, it has to end on a negative charge. It'll find it somewhere in the world. If it doesn't find it here, it'll find it in some galaxy, but it has to end in another. That's just electrostatics, right? So any, any positive charge, electric field starts and has to end with a negative charge. So that's just given. The question is, where does it find it? In case of a dielectric, it will not find it inside the dielectric. It will find it at the other side of the plate, okay? So my question was, so everyone said, oh, it's, it's constant electric field. And if I ask them why it's constant, then they say, oh, because the potential uh, slope is constant, then the dV over dx is constant, and that's why the electric field is negative of that, okay? So just assume it's all magnitudes for now, because the direction is, is in the opposite direction. So my question was, the electric field is not very obvious why it is constant because I have free charge, free carrier here, right? Free carrier. So why is it not ending? Well, one intuitive explanation I can give you ending is that it'll never end here. Once I have an electron, you put an electric field, it'll have a force. What's the force? F equals to? QE. QE. QE, right? And if it is free, Exactly, if it is free, if it is immobile, then that force will not do anything. But I mean, it'll put a force on the dipole, but, but if it is free, it'll start moving. So it can never end there, right? It'll just keep moving and then we'll come to that now. But I was just trying to uh, show you an intuitive way of why instead of explaining it through the electric field is constant, you actually find out that the voltage through that material has a constant slope, okay? And the reason it has a constant slope is I know that this is the voltage VR. I know this is zero. And I said, this material is a big resistor. And what I did was I split them into four equal or you can do eight equal or 16 equal or 32 equal or whatever, 100 equal, but I'm just giving a point. So if I split it into, it split this R into four equal ones and I said, okay, let me see what the potential here is. It turned out to be three V by four. I said, okay, what's the potential here? It's half. Oh, what's the potential here? It's uh, one by four. And if I join all this, that's a linear line. And if I take the derivative of that, that has to be constant, which is electric field inside it. Okay. Did that make sense, uh, Devashri? Yes, sir. Okay. So everyone agrees with this, right? So be it 
a resistive material or a, be it a dielectric, uh, once you apply a voltage across it, and this is what's called a low field approximation. You don't have to worry about it. We always assume that it's a low field. Uh, if it is a low electric field, then you get the constant electric field just like in the dielectric. Okay, so now the next question is, if it is constant just like dielectric, uh, what happens to the free electrons? So like as I said, they have this force, okay, inside this block of material. So you have this block of material, you have this electric field, and you have all these free electrons, right? So you get this force. If you get a force, then that's mass times acceleration. So they start accelerating, but they can't keep accelerating. They'll just start bumping into the crystal lattice. They'll bump here, then they'll start accelerating, then they'll bump here, then they'll start accelerating, they'll bump here, they'll start accelerating, and they'll just keep doing this. Okay, so what hap what's happening is that it's not allowing it to accelerate and keep having momentum and reaching some enormous velocity. What happens is it keeps doing this, banging on to the lattices and depending on the temperature of your and the, the way you have doped it, the kind of material, if I just take a cross section and I look at the average amount of electrons passing through them, I see actually there is an average velocity of these electrons, okay? And that average velocity of the electron is directly proportional to this electric field which is passing through this, okay? And this electric field is obviously equal to V over same distance, V over L, or in this case, we'll call it VR over L, okay? Everyone follows still here, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And this proportion, it's, it's a proportionality constant and in, in its very simplest form is mu times E, okay? And this is the mobility we keep talking about and that's what's called the mobility. And essentially it tells you how mobile is your electron inside this particular material, okay? Or I can write VD equals to mu times V over X and all that, okay? So, so basically what happens is you apply electric field, what you get is a current, right? So you apply electric field and you get a current. So I'm going to just quickly show you the elements of this current and hopefully it'll be clear. Otherwise, uh, just uh, let me know. But this is a, uh, try to understand this because we are going, when we see the, uh, the currents of um, a MOS transistor, uh, when the channels are formed, they're actually, uh, the same mechanism. This is what's called uh, current through drift. This is drift mechanism, okay? In semiconductor, you also get diffusion, but this is purely through drift. Drift in the sense, you have electric field, you have free carriers, they start drifting, okay? And so let's assume, so I'll just do a quick derivation of the, the current through this material. So let's assume uh, this material, like we said, it's an N-type with some, uh, doping of ND in them. Uh, so the total charge you can write as Q total uh, ND times the charge of an electron times W times L times uh, H. So basically total volume times uh, the number of electrons, right? Per unit volume. That's your total charge inside this block material. Now in IC design, um, this part is not under our control. So when you're doing, because this is what's called planar technology, right? So it's planar in the sense, we all do everything in X, Y. The Z is, is, a, is, a, is a forbidden zone for IC designers. You can't do anything in Z. That's only controlled by the foundry house, okay? So if that's the case, then uh, uh, really I want to find out what's the Q per unit area, right? unit area of, uh, so when I say unit area, I'm looking at this W over L. So I'm looking at this top, sort of sort of the top view. So the Q unit area, I'll just call it as Q, uh, let's say dash or Q sheet, let's call it Q sheet, QSH, okay? Which is basically this Q total um, divided by the unit area. So you basically take this and the, uh, this, this total charge over here divided by uh, the area, that's your unit charge, which in this language will be ND times Q times H, right? So Q sheet. Okay, so that's your unit area. Now, 
the way I want to find out what's uh, the flow of the electron per, uh, per time, per unit time, is I can just take a cross section, right? So let's say I take a cross section in this area. Okay, and I just look at, so let's say I have a counter and I'm just monitoring the amount of uh, electrons which are moving through this cross section per unit time. And that basically will be my eye, right? So if I just look at any cross section because KCL has to be valid, right? So it doesn't matter where I take this cross section, this current is equal to this cross section, this cross section, this cross section, or even in the cross section of the wire, they all have to be same because the KCL has to be valid. It's not the same for voltage, but current has to be same. So I take any arbitrary place, I just take a cross section, okay? And the cross section, I can find the, the, the charge flowing through unit time unit time is nothing but this sheet that is the charge density per unit area, okay, which will be this Q sheet times W because I take the unit area, multiplied by, by the W, it gives me the charge per unit length. And that's what I'm looking for, unit length. And if I multiply it with um, the velocity, because then it tells me this unit, how fast it traveled. So that is the total amount of charge which has traveled per unit time. And this is equal to my total current flowing through this. Okay. And if I just expand this, then this is the sheet um, charge times W and VD. We said it's uh, mu times the electric field, which is basically the voltage across it divided by L. And that's my current I, okay. Everyone follows still here? Uh, any, any questions? I know this might be a little bit uh, confusing to follow. Basically what I'm saying is, I know we have proven that the electric field is constant. And if the electric field is constant, there is a velocity, average velocity of the electrons which is proportional to that electric field because it will just not keep accelerating. That's just the nature of material. It will not keep accelerating. It will just keep bumping into the lattices. So we said, okay, there is some average velocity which is dependent on what's called the mobility of that material. Okay. And that mobility tells you how fast the electrons are traveling through a cross-section area. So I said the cross-section, if I assume there is a sheet uh, charge density, so basically coulomb per area, and I multiply that by W, so I get the charge which is in this per unit length, in this thin sheet in cross section, what is the charge? Then I find out how many of these sheets are traveling per unit time, so I multiplied that by the velocity, which is basically distance over time, right? So this is distance over time. So if I took a unit length of sheet, and found out the distance it traveled, that entire volume of charge is what the charge traveled through unit time, and that's my current by definition. Okay. Any, any questions so far? Make sense? You might want to just uh, revise this by yourself. Uh, I think it'll be clear, but just uh, for now, maybe if it is, you know, if, you, if it is bugging you, just kind of trust me on this and don't have to completely trust me. Let me write the equation in a different way. Maybe that'll make sense. Can you please repeat the current part? Uh, which part? Like how did I get the current to yes, be sir, this total, equation? Total current. Total total current. current. Yeah, so the total current is, um, basically what I'm saying is, let me just start a new one. So I have a block. I have a block of this resistive material, right? And I apply a voltage across this material here. And, and we just proved that the electric field is constant here. The electric field is constant. And so in order to find, and that constant electricity, uh, electric field 
puts a force, but the electron can't keep accelerating. They keep bombarding against the walls of uh, lattices. And if I just look at a cross section, I find that uh, just a thin cross section, I find that these electrons actually have an average velocity, which is proportional to this electric field. And that proportional constant is actually what's called mu, which is actually measured. You can actually derive it from statistical mechanics too, but most of the time it's just measured. And, and this E is nothing but V over X. So this was uh, L, let's say, this is the length. And this was some value VR. Then this is mu times VR over L is the velocity. And then I said, okay, let's this be some, let's say, n-type material, which was uh, uh, doped with, uh, for example, 10 to the power 18 doping like phosphorus atoms or something like that per centimeter cube. So I said, okay, uh, forget about the volume because in IC design, we always talk about area. So I said, okay, let's take Q sheet, which is uh, the charge per unit area, okay? So basically you're taking a unit area and finding the charge. And I said, if you take QSH and multiply it by W, which is this length here, that gives you this sheet charge in this cross section. Okay, because you're taking a unit area, multiplying it over the W, so that gives you the charge in this sheet. And I want to find out how many of these sheets are traveling per unit time, and that will be basically the velocity of the electrons, because this is the distance per unit time. So I find out that that many sheets of these uh, thing travel. So let's say if I stack all these sheets over some time T over VD, this is what I get. So this is the total charge, which has traveled over a unit time, and that's equal to I. You get this? You can, yes, I, yeah, so the best way to do this is go home, write the units of everything, and that's the easiest way to figure out, okay, this is actually charge per unit time, and that should be I, okay? Yes, sir. Okay, and I said, um, and that this equation, this equation I equals to QSHW overall mu VR, which I derived from the above, I'll just rewrite it, okay? So I'll rewrite this as V, uh, or R equals to one over QSH mu L over W times I. I just rewrote this previous equation as this, okay? Just rearrange algebraically. Okay, can you recognize this equation now? What does this look like? This part here, what does this look like? Resistance. Resistance. Yeah, resistance, right? So for a resistance material, I do what? R sheet or rho sheet times L over W, right? So, so, so in semiconductor, even a channel, it's nothing but a resistance, right? It's the same thing. So, okay, like I said before, now let's see. So anytime you're deriving equation, it's always good to, good to do a sanity check. Okay, what do I mean by sanity check? Is like, is all the, all the proportionality is making sense or not? Okay, so, so we'll take this resistance equation and see if all the proportionality is making sense or not. QSH mu L over W. Okay, so let's start with the first one. Okay, so this equation says that if my sheet, um, that is charge per unit area increases, then the resistance decreases. Make sense or not? Does it make sense, guys? Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> okay, why? Can somebody tell why? If the sheet, re sheet um, charge is increasing, the resistance is decreasing? Because resistivity is decreasing, uh, in increasing. Sorry, so seat, because of seat charge is inversely proportional to resistance. No, that, that's that's in the equation. I'm asking intuitively from a physical sense, does it make sense? What does resistance mean? That if I apply a voltage, if the resistance is small, the current will be large or the charge per unit 
will be large. Time would be large, right? Yes. Right. So if everything remains same, I just increase the number of charges in that. That means the number of charges per unit cross section area increase. this will increase, mm -hmm. right? For the same VR. For the same VR. Yes, sir. Yes. So which means that it looks like a smaller resistance. So obviously that makes sense, right? <laughs> Yes, what, yes. what about mobility? So the mobility is also inversely proportional in the sense that um, increase the number of uh, if the, the mobility decreases. Yeah. So the mobility was defined. So let me go back to the definition of mobility. So the definition of the mobility was this, right? So in other words, so if I'll write it again, so the average electron velocity was directly proportional to this to nu. So what does this mean physically? It means that if this value is large, the electrons will have less resistance and will travel faster, right? That yes, means sir. per unit time in a small cross-section area, you'll have more electrons fl flying through. Okay, so that's why it's called mobility. So that's why if the mobility is high here, it makes sense that the resistance is less. smaller. Yes. Correct? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Excellent. Make sense, everyone? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Let's get to the next one, length. So directly proportional to the length. Makes sense? If so, why? Yes. If length will increase, the electrons will uh, keep bumping up more and more, so... The number of charges increase, charge density. The time to travel time to travel okay so here is the thing with length right it is a little bit counterintuitive i think chandan you got it right but i'll i'll tell you why it's a little bit counterintuitive you're taking a cross section area right and you're saying i'm just interested in this cross section area wherever i take it it is same if i increase the length it looks like it should not change at all right doesn't matter where i take the cross section it's traveling through the same thing but Chandan said the right thing is that this VD, okay, the average velocity, that actually will change. Although this remains the same because this is per unit length. This VD we calculate is per unit length because it's, it's like Chandan said, it keeps bumping from the time it comes from here to here to this end. If I increase this by 2L, it'll take twice the time because now it has twice the number of bumps than it had before, okay? Make sense, guys? Yes, sir. Yeah. And if it takes twice the more amount of time in that cross-section area per unit time, now there'll be half the charges flowing, right? Which means the resistance-wise, it looks like twice, twice the more resistance. Yes, sir. Everyone got it, right? Yes, sir. Yes. Everyone should understand this equation very, very well because all your digital sizing, everything will have this and the mu all over the place all your digital gates, how you size it, finding delays, your ST analysis, everything boils down to these three quantities. Okay, so you should understand why it's dependent on one and uh, other, other, right? Obviously you can mechanically do it, but like as I said, your foundation should not be done mechanically. You should have a very strong uh, foothold on it. Okay, W, it is inversely proportional. Everyone agrees with this? If yes, why? Yes or no? Guys? So, if we, so if we increase the W, so the current will be increasing. Why is the current increasing? The more charge will flow. Cross section area will increase. The cross section area is increasing, correct? Yes, so your number of bumps are still the same because the length hasn't increasing, but your charges, number of charges, the Q, Q per unit length, per unit length is now double right? Yes, it's twice before. If I make 2W, then this charge will be what was before, right? Previous, let's say Q dash. So if the number of charges double, then the number of charges per unit time also will double. So which means the new current will be two times I dash, which means the new resistance will be half of that. Everyone, everyone agrees with this? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. 
Okay, somebody has somebody has a question. No, everyone agrees. All right, so let's see if everyone understands it. So let me ask a question now. So I take a resistive material, I measure the resistance, and this is W, this is L. Forget the high. Since turns out to be, so let's say this is um, R1 is equal to uh, one kilo ohm. Guys, can you all hear me or did I cut off? I saw internet. So cut off. So, cut off so, not. Off. So we can hear, sir. You can't hear me anymore? How about now? Yes, sir, we yes, can hear. Can. Yes, sir. We can hear. Until the question, we can. Okay, I think I must have a little bit of an intermittent connection. Okay, it's fine now, right? Yes, sir. Okay. All right, so I take this uh, block and it turns out to be one kilo ohm. Okay, I have some W. Have some L with that height. I increase the W, new W to two W. What's the new R? Okay, I'll not everyone answer. I'll pick someone. Aniket, come on the line and answer. Aniket Singh, Are you there? Looks like he's his dog is watching this now. <laughs> Shirag, what's new yes, W? Sir. What's the new, new w? w? Yeah, W is, yeah, so new. I increase the W by twice. What's the new R? So the so R, R by two. R by two, which is what? If it was one R, kilo 0 .5, 0 .5. 0 0.5. Okay, 500 ohms. Okay, let's see if uh, someone else agrees with, with you. Uh, how about Himadri? <laughs> You agree with this or is it 2R or R by 2 or R by 3 or how much is it? No, sir, I agree with this. Okay, 500. Okay, good. How about uh, Rashmi Ranjan? You agree with this or you have a different number? Yes, sir. Agree? Okay. Agree All right. Okay, Rashmi, stay online. Now I do something else. I instead of W, I increase L by three times. So new L is equal to three L. What's the new resistance? So I'll call it double dash. What's the new resistance? Rashmi, you there? Yes, sir. Okay, so what's the new resistance? W is the same as before. Now increase the L by 3L. What's the new resistance? Uh, that three times it will increase. Three times, okay. Three kilo ohms, okay. Uh, Abhishek, Abhishek Kar. Yes, what's sir. the new resistance? What's the new resistance? So three kilo ohms. Three kilohms, okay. How about uh, Akshat Arpit? Akshat, you there? Okay, how about Abhilash? So Akshat and Aniket, I think their dogs are watching. How about Abhilash? Sir, three kilohm. Okay, three kilohm. So that's still three kilohm. So everyone agrees with this? It's three kilohms? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, okay. so when you are changing one parameter, the other one is still constant or the other one will also change? No, no. I, this is obviously a problem. Obviously anyone. They are independently changeable, right? Say that again. So like uh, if a solid material is there and if you yeah. change the width, the length will also change. No, but here you are con oh. uh, making the length constant. No, no, uh, hold on a second. Why, why will the length change if you are changing the W? So if area is constant and uh, uh, you are changing width, then length will change. Well, why is area constant? Who said area is constant? Okay. Oh, here area is not. 
I, I never said area is constant. I just gave you a material and I said it has WL. And so the area is W times L obviously. And I said, I just take a new, I mean, I just take that same material and I add a W twice or add the LW, right? So you can okay. change them independently, right? Yes. All I'm saying is that in IC design, we can't change the height. That's usually controlled by the foundry, but the W and L, they are completely changeable within some max limits. So they'll give you a W max, W min, and you basically has to be within that, right? So you can be greater than this and less than this, or and same thing with L. So they'll give you some design rules, but you can change it within that design rule. Okay. All right. So let's take the next parameter. So I took, so let's say this was an end type material with uh, some doping constant ND. Okay. And that gave me one kilo ohm. Now I dope it half the number of items. So I do ND by two. Okay. Now what's the new resistance? Okay, let me take uh, Pranab, Pranab Pal. What's the new resistance? Uh, half. Okay, R is half. Why is it half? Uh, Why is it half? Sir, if uh, doping is more, then mobility uh, is affected. Uh. Okay, well, that's a good point, but let's assume mobility is not affected. Okay, so the mobility remains the same. You're not audible, sir. Okay, can, can you all hear me now or not? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So, yeah, so it's probably on your side then. I think it was Punya Dev. Can I answer, sir? Yeah, go ahead. Yes, sir. Two times, sir. Two times? Yes, sir. Okay, why is it two times? Say that again. Who who answered two R, by the way? Sir, here, what, QSH equal to ND by two. So when we put- No, no, no just tell me in words. Tell me in words. Don't go back to the equation yet. Tell me in words. Like we have been explaining so far. We use the equation to come here, but now, you know, sure. we're trying to intuitively see why why they're changing in direction. Because we are looking at, you know, what is affecting in what direction. And that's always key in VLSI design. You have to know how things are affecting in what order, right? Yes. Um, Sir, because doping is half, so charge carriers will be less. Sir. So resistance More will number be of less. charge carriers, Sir. more number of bumps. Sir, charge... Uh, Charge per unit area is decreased, is half set, that's why the width is resistance will be decreased. Okay, I think some of, yeah, so, so okay, I'll address one by one. Um, so I think uh, Shiti said that, uh, what uh, you said more number of charge per unit area, right? So that's why no, sir, less, less number, right? Because, because I, less, I went, less doping. right, so I went from, let's say 10 to the power 18 to 10 to the power 18 by two, so I have less number of uh, holes. So that means it's more resistive because the current is half now. So the resistance, effective resistance looks like twice now, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and Chandan raised the point that uh, there are less uh, number of bumps now. Well, that's actually what, the bumps are actually related to the mobility. So that's a good point actually. When you actually bombard them, the mobility actually changes, but the change in mobility compared to the number of available free carriers is actually very small. So that's not an issue. So that means the mobility remains the same and your length remains the same, just your cross section remains the same. Now the number of charges available for that cross section area has decreased by half. So that's why you're going to get half. But you're right, in, in reality, when you do that half, actually the mobility also changes and then it's a complex equation. But to the first order, this is correct. Two R is correct. Okay. Does this make sense now? Like I just said, this is, uh, if you're a VLSI engineer, if you understand this, how it is changing with L, W, Q, S, H, and mu, uh, you can solve like lots and lots of problems not knowing anything about other parts of VLSI design. Okay. And, uh, and the other way is also right. Uh, if you 
don't know this and know some complicated stuff, then you'll easily get stuck, even though you might know a lot of equations and stuff like that. Okay. So this all makes sense now, right? And we'll use this expression actually when we are doing the current equation for, for the MOS transistor. Any, any questions on this part yet? So we showed the electric field in a dielectric and how it affects the dielectric uh, the potential in the dielectric and so on. And we showed that same potential if we put it across a block of a resistor material or a semiconductor, which has been doped as a resistor material and how it looks like. And, um, and the current, we kind of derive the current equations from that as well. Okay. Any, any questions so far on this one? Okay, so let me see, I think there are some chat questions maybe let me see if okay it was akshit saying his audio is not working okay that's fine all right so if there are no questions the final thing i want to quickly review before we uh, see the mass is uh, the pn junction just a quick uh, review of the PN junction before we start the MOS. Okay. So we, we start for the PN junction uh, last time we started with uh, what's called an intrinsic material. And for intrinsic, all it means it's a pure silicon or a pure germanium or a pure crystalline structure. So in a pure crystalline structure, your uh, each atoms are perfectly bonded with, uh, like for example, silicon has four valence electrons. So it finds four perfectly uh, neighbors to bond with. And uh, you know this guy finds another four and so on. It's perfect lattices, right? And if I draw what's called the band diagram, uh, now the band diagram, uh, it is, uh, it helps you in finding what's called the contact potential. Like, uh, okay, Akshit, you have a question? You raised your hand. Do you have a question or? Okay, no. All right, um, so a band diagram uh, helps you in two things. Uh, well, a couple of things, I guess. Um, one is it helps you find what's called contact potential. So it's kind of good to know what a band diagram is. You really don't need to know to know the function of the circuits, uh, uh, but it's good uh, to know because certain part of like when you're deriving the MOS transfer functions easier with band diagrams. Uh, now, if you get deeper into band diagrams, you get complex, obviously, but at least the basics you should you should have an understanding of. Um, and like I said last time, the band diagram is, uh, it's a diagram where uh, the x-axis is obviously the x-direction of this material. For example, let's say this was a block of silicon. And on the y-axis, it basically shows you the potential of the electrons. And a couple of uh, definitions you need to know in band diagrams is one is the valence band, which is uh, usually denoted by EV. Another is your conduction band denoted by EC. So for example, in a silicon, although they're all finely bonded, uh, even at room temperature, there's enough thermal energy that some bond might break and actually you might get a free electron. And if you get a free electron, you leave behind what's called a hole, which is actually a positive charge. So this is a, is a negative carrier, this is a positive carrier. In a band diagram, the way you show it is, uh, everything below EV is what's called available states for the electrons, Every, everything above is also called available, but these are what's called the forbidden zone. That's why it's called the band gap, okay? So that means the electron cannot have energy level, cannot occupy any energy level in between. And if the energy, if the electron is sitting here below this, uh, so let me, below this valence band, 
they cannot conduct. So if I apply a voltage across this V with respect to this node here, there will be no uh, current flowing unless one of these gets to the conduction band, okay? And the way they get is through thermal agitation. So this band gap is usually about 1.1 electron volt. So because of thermal agitation, if this electron gets enough energy, let's say 1.1 electron volt, this will jump to the, and now it's available for conduction, okay? And in a typical material, uh, you can get, because of this thermal agitation, you can get up to, uh, so if I, it is usually donate, denoted by what's called the carrier concentration of uh, uh, intrinsic material. And they are uh, about 1.45 times 10 to the power 10 carriers per centimeter cube, okay? Uh, don't have to, some numbers are good to remember. You probably don't have to remember this, but uh, it might seem a lot, but if you consider the number of atoms, silicon atoms per uh, uh, unit volume per centimeter cube, uh, they're about, I think, five to the power, 10 to the power 22 per centimeter cube. So if you compare this ratio, you're talking about one in 10 to the power 12 atoms. So it's really tiny. So it's not enough for conduction. Okay, the higher the temperature goes, you get more, but uh, just the intrinsic itself is not good for conduction. Okay, the other level which uh, you're going to talk about is what's called a Fermi level. Okay, and that's denoted by EF. Now the Fermi level, it's like a fictitious level. Obviously this is not allowed, but it shows you what's the probability of an electron which can occupy uh, this state, which is probability of, with a probability of 50%. Now it's 50% because every time an electron goes here, it leaves a hole behind, okay? So that's why this is usually halfway in between the conduction and the valence band. Because for an intrinsic semiconductor, every time an electron leaves here, it leaves a hole behind. Every time it leaves here, it leaves a hole behind. Since the whole energy is close to EV, electron energy is close to EC, the 50% energy is kind of halfway in between, almost halfway in between. Okay, so that's called the Fermi, Fermi level. Okay, now if I want to make this more conductive, like as I said, uh, normally you get about this many carriers, so like it looks a lot, but if you consider the number of atoms available in a, a block of silicon, that's actually pretty small. So now if I want to uh, make it conductive, what I do is I take the same block of silicon. Okay, so let's say I, I, I want to make it, uh, make it an n-type or I want to have a lot more electrons than, than this quantity here, okay? So then I do what's called dope it, dope it. And the, usually the doping concentration for uh, n-type is uh, denoted by nd. So this is again number of atoms per centimeter cube. So for example, I can take phosphorus. Uh, I forget what the phosphorus code is, but uh, phosphorus. And that has five valence electrons, right? So if I get, uh, uh, so let's say I have a one, oops, sorry. If I have one phosphorus atom here, one phosphorus atom here, it'll bond with, with uh, four silicon atoms. So this is P, okay, four, one. But then it'll leave one electron free to conduct. Okay, but when this one leaves for conduction, it actually leaves a positive charge, but this is an immobile positive charge. Unlike, unlike in the silicon, it is immobile uh, silicon charge. Uh, that means it cannot move. It'll, it'll just, it'll have a negative positive charge, but it'll st just stay there. Okay, so if I draw the band diagram for this, then if I see the conduction band, and if I look at the valence, uh, I mean, sorry, this is the valence band, this is the conduction band. And now if I look at the Fermi level, it's very close to the conduction band now because now they need very little energy to jump here. In fact, a lot of them are already here. And that's why the average energy for 50% occupancy is very close to the conduction band. All it means is that I have a lot of uh, electrons available for conduction right now. And, uh, oh, by the way, just another expression, um, so, in an in a intrinsic um, semiconductor, you have about, uh, for example, 1.45 into 10 to the power 10 uh, electrons, right? Electrons, I'll call it E electrons per 
centimeter cube. Uh, and like as you saw here, every time electron leaves, it leaves a hole. It actually has the same, so same number of holes as well. Centimeter cube, okay? And this is a law called mass action law, which basically tells you the, in any semiconductor, doped or undoped, uh, it is, uh, if you take the product of the holes and uh, the electron concentration, it is actually square of the intrinsic semiconductor. And here, obviously, that's the case for the intrinsic one. Now, if you look at the, uh, the band diagram, or if you look at, uh... yeah, there was three, go ahead. What's, what's the question? No, sir, no, sir, by mistake. Okay, no problem. So now if you want to dope it, like as I said, you dope it with something which has more electrons in their valence band. So that gives you a free electron. And uh, how many can you dope? And that's also, you, you just can't, you cannot just arbitrarily dope, right? So you have on one side, let me use another color here. So on one side, you have about five to the power 10, 22 centimeter cube. That's the number of atoms uh, per unit volume. On the other side, you have the free electron uh, density for an intrinsic semiconductor, which is about 1.5 into, what did I say, 10 to the power 10 per centimeter cube. So obviously it's like 10 to the power 12 orders of magnitude, 12 orders of magnitude in between. Now this doping you do, you need to be much, much higher than this for it to be conductive. But at the same time, you need to be much, much lower than the number of atoms available. Because if you dope it much higher than that, what will happen is it becomes what's called, if you, if you get very close to this, uh, then what happens is what's called a degenerate, uh, sil uh, degenerate silicon. So it basically it doesn't behave like a dope silicon anymore. You can't use it for doing devices. And if you're more on this side, then it's very resistive, you can't conduct. And this range usually is about 10 to the power 15 to 10 to the power 18, 18 uh, dopants per centimeter cube, okay? So per centimeter cube. So you have to remain within this, this limit, roughly within this limit. And typically if you dope it around 10 to the power 15 or less than that, you'll see it's usually called N type or N minus or just N type. Uh, if you dope it close to 10 to the power 18 or more, usually you'll see it's called as N plus, okay? And uh, somewhere in between it's just called N, okay? Uh, so if you see like, for example, it says P plus, that means the acceptor atoms, uh, are close to 10 to the power 18 atoms per centimeter cube. That's the volume. So just know these numbers because you know that way you know, like you know, when we do drains, they are always called n plus p pluses. The p substrate has to be less than that. And we'll talk a little bit more about why they're you know more resistive, less resistive, and so on. Okay. So so yeah, you can dope it. So for example, let's say you dope this uh, electron with uh, let's say 10, 10 to the power 15. Uh, atoms, then at room temperature, your number of available electrons to conduct are pretty close to 10 to the power 15, okay, which is basically your concentration of the doping atoms. And if you look at the concentration of the holes, the hole carriers, there you use the this law here, the mass action law, mass action law, okay. And if you use that, then this will be what? 1.45 times, this will be square of that times 10 to the power 20 divided by this, uh, the concentration of electrons, which is 10 to the power 15. So this is about uh, 1.5, which is about 10, um, roughly about two times 10 to the power five, right? So it's a lot less than the concentration of uh, electrons. So that's why this is called your major, in a, in a uh, N type material, this is called a majority carrier. And uh, this is called your minority carrier. 
okay and you do the same thing for p type uh, you actually dope it with something which has one less electron like boron and uh, all the rest of the equation remains the same so instead of a free electron you get a free hole and the number of atoms of boron you dope it with that many holes free holes you get for conduction and so on and your um, um, the fermi level will be close to so maybe just quickly show this so if i have a p, p type material now p type material so if i have a p type material then i'll bombard it with boron and then if i look at the valence band and conduction band then my fermi level will be close to the valence band because for holes it needs to be close to here for conducting so if i have holes in the valence band they can conduct for electrons it needs to be in there now another quantity so usually this will be called let's say efp showing that it's a fermi level of um, the p type material and another quantity which we'll be using a lot is what's called a fermi potential it just basically shows you how much you have deviated from the intrinsic fermi level and this is given by what's called fermi potential and that's the equation is kt over ln and this is usually the fermi potential minus uh, in this case it will be efp efp so it'll be a positive quantity so it's a natural log of uh, the acceptor ions over the intrinsic ion and again this quantity again is a good number to remember kt which is the thermal voltage is uh, roughly 25 millivolts right 25 millivolts okay so if i have doped it with uh, let's say 10 to the power 15 atoms uh, this is usually if you calculate you put 10 to the power 15 here and 10 to the power 10 here uh, then your fermi potential uh, uh, is roughly about uh, i think 0.28 volts uh, if it is close to a really high so this will be like p this will be p plus and that will be close to uh, i think 0.5 volts or 0 0.45 0 0.45 volts okay you just basically plug this in this equation so 25 millivolts times the natural log ratio of this dopant concentration the reason i'm giving this number is because uh, when we start talking about contact potential and um, you know junction potential we'll see that it is all dependent on this so essentially it tells you how p type it is or how n type it is okay A any questions on this far uh, we just kind of repeating what we did last time any any questions uh, so far? Okay, maybe I should ask a question then. All right, let me ask this. If I show you a band diagram of a material, so I have the conduction band, I mean, sorry, valence band and a conduction band and the fermi potential is close to sorry this is conduction band okay is this a n type or p type okay everyone agrees with that Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, good. Yes, sir. All right. I find I take another material, it's an N type, but its fermi potential is a little bit lower. So this is case one, this is case two. Whose doping is higher? Case one or case two? Case one, sir. Case one, sir. Okay, good. So case one doping is case one doping is higher than case two, right? So the more we dope it, the closer it gets to conduction band for electrons, for holes, it's the other way around. Okay? Okay, sir. All right, so next is uh, PN junction. Again, PN junction, in IC, when you're trying to do physical design, I mean, you're just buried with PN junction. So it's again, critical to understand PN junction as well. So 
if I take, now I take uh, the two materials. So let's say I take a P plus, okay. And I join it with a P minus, I mean an N. So let's say this is N type, this is P type and I'll call it P plus. So this is heavily doped. This is not that heavily doped. I join them, okay. Now, because the, um, so let's say this was 10 to the power 18 per centimeter, that's how much it was doped with, and this was about 10 to the power 15 was how much it was doped it with. So let's say this was doped with phosphorus and this was doped with boron. So two types of material. Now I join them, right? So when I join them, this has a lot of free electrons to move with higher potential than these electrons over here or holes over here, right? So what will happen is because they have higher potential, they'll start moving into this direction, okay? And when they move, they will leave a immobile charge here and they will go and get attached to one of the bonds here and they will create a immobile negative charge here. And because of that, you'll get electric field. Like as I said, every positive charge needs to emanate, so it'll create a small electric field. So now the potential has slowed a little bit. Now another electron finds, do the same thing. It says, okay, I have a higher potential. I tend to go in this direction. So it'll leave that and it'll start going in this direction. Okay. And it'll just keep doing that. And this is what's called depletion region because it's depleted of its majority carrier. So on the N type, it's depleted of its majority carriers electrons. On the P type, it's depleted of its majority carriers, which is whole. And this will keep happening. This will keep happening till, and as it is building up, okay, the electric field is also moving in, you know, the, this is also building up. This electric field is building up. It'll keep happening till the electric field just counterattacks the potential difference, right? So what I mean by that is, everyone's there, right? The electric field is a negative of the potential difference. So you had a potential difference previously. If that electric field is equal to this potential difference in an aggregate fashion, then these electrons now have no motivation to go behind it or they cannot surpass this electric field. And that's when this will stop and you get what's called a built-in potential, okay? So we'll look at the electric field inside this and the potential, but I'll, let me show you from a band diagram point of view. So if I take the band diagram, the one thing which uh, th thermodynamics says is that your, your intrinsic, um, I mean, your Fermi level has to be the Fermi energy band has to be same. Once they've joined, it has to be same. So let me draw this a little bit higher. Has to be same. It cannot be different in a in a material which has been joined together so because it looks like a homogeneous material now. So it has to be same. But I know that this is an type material. Okay, where should be the conduction band? Uh, let's start with the valence band. Closer to this level or away from the level? Away from away right so from let's yes, say sir. from here to here the valence band will look like this and this will look like that right sorry this is the conduction band and what about the p side the p side because this is still p side nothing has changed this looks like the old p side so the valence band will be very close to fermi level. closer sir to the fermi level right and away as much as away. So this difference should be phi f like we calculated before. So this should be away by that much, right? And obviously in between, they need to, uh, the potential needs to finally join them together. And that's what is called the bending of the bands, right? So essentially to keep the, the constant uh, Fermi level, this band needs to bend, okay? And another way of uh, find, uh, uh, intuitively understanding why they have to bend is because you have electric field now, right? So there is no electric field beyond this. There's no electric field beyond this. And the electric field starts building up from here 
and it's maximum over here and then it drops. Because if I look at right this edge, there is no electric field. Here, I have a couple of positive atoms which are emanating this. And here it will be maximum because whatever is the charge over here, all the electric fields point here. Then when I come here, they're slowly reducing because some of the electric fields are terminated by these electrons and then they go over here. And if I look at this, then if I look at the potential, then they just follow the potential such that the dv over dx is equal to this electric field which is passing over here. Okay, now how much does this bend by? So this, this difference here, this bending, or which is equal to actually the potential difference between these two points because I have electric field or a potential difference. So I have to have a potential difference. So this is called the built-in potential, okay? Um, sometimes called just phi or phi b or phi b i, um, different name, but that's called a built-in potential. What should be the amount of this built-in potential? What do you think? I mean, you can obviously calculate and all that from a, from a band gap perspective. What do you think should be the, the value of this. When I say value of this in terms of, um, so what do I should, uh, in terms of uh, the only quantity I have, phi f, right? This phi f I have. So there is a there is a Fermi potential for this one, phi f n, and there's a Fermi potential for this one, which is phi f p. So in terms of this, what should be the built-in potential here? Okay, phi, somebody said phi FP. Phi FP minus phi FN, okay. And that's nothing but EF, uh, uh, EFN minus EFP if you expand these two quantities, okay. Now, can somebody tell me why that is the quantity? from a band gap perspective? So, so I drew the, the resultant one, but before I brought it together, so let me draw on the band diagram before I brought it together. So before I brought it together, the P type, the P plus type was here, right? So I had EC, sorry, I keep doing EC here, EV, and this is EC, this is for the P type, right? And for the, and let me draw the, so for the P type, this is EFP and compared to the intrinsic Fermi level, it is this quantity phi FP, right? Then if I bring the P type, just side by side. So this is EV again, EC, and let's say this was the intrinsic. This is my EFN, and this is the phi FN, which all depends on the doping. These two differences also depend on the doping, right? Because of this, this equation here. Get your Q is the same, and I is the same, but depending on the doping, it will be closer to the conduction band or the valence band for the P type. Now, like I said, the thermodynamics says that these two levels needs to be same. So it says these two levels needs to be same. They cannot be different when I join them together. Now, if they need to be same, then these should bend by this quantity here, right? Which is, EFN minus EFP or is equal to phi FP minus phi FN. Everyone sort of gets this, right? So, so basically, you know, you can go from a charge perspective, but sometimes the, you know, if you kind of have faith in the band diagram, it's a little bit easier to kind of go from the band diagram. Okay, any, any questions on this one? Why the band is, uh, why is your built-in volta voltage equal to the Fermi potential of P and minus? 
again this is an important quantity to know because this will be part of the vt equation as well sir, just at, at least conceptually you should know yeah go ahead saurabh sir is it should be 5fn plus 5fp or 5fp minus 5fn plus sign minus um so the definition you know some books have different uh, definitions but it's basically this difference uh, so our definition the way we defined is vf is uh, let's say vfp is the fermi potential of the sorry fermi potential of the intrinsic minus fermi potential of the p type in this case this will be a positive quantity right and yes. for phi n it is the same definition ef of the intrinsic minus efn but efn is actually higher than efi so this will be a negative quantity so essentially this minus this is two positive quantities or if you take the magnitude of this you can write it this as the magnitude of phi fp plus magnitude of phi fn okay if it is confusing you Did that make sense, sir? Of yes, sir. Okay, good. All right, and uh, just to give you an idea of uh, typically why the built-in potential is about uh, you know 0.6 or 0.5, because uh, you know we just calculated using this equation that uh, if it is lightly doped, it is about 0.28. If it is heavily doped, it is about 0.45. So, um, so if I take this built-in potential, uh, V B or phi B. Uh, then it is uh, 0.48 plus let's say 0.2, 0.45 plus 0.3. Let's say just to make it easy, easier, it's about 0.75 volts, and that's what it's called the built-in potential, or it's called the contact potential as well. Okay, and I want you to pay attention to how the band is bending in the depletion region. Okay, because when we do the derivation of the threshold voltage, or show you how the threshold voltage is acting, it'll be it'll be clearer if you look at it this way. Okay, and just remember, this is the electron energy. If I look at the voltage, which is the energy of a uh, As a positive charge, equal positive charge, it's exactly the opposite. The sign just inverts. Okay, so the band diagram. Remember, it's the energy of the electron. So when I draw the potential as a battery potential inside it, with reference to this, it will actually be the opposite. Okay, so so just kind of be aware of that um, uh, fact. Okay, so now we just quickly show you what. Uh, so this is when they are just joined. Okay, any any questions on so far? This is. So can you again uh, explain the graph? Which Electric one? Field graph. Electric field gap. Gap. Uh, graph. Oh, this graph here. Yes, sir. Okay, so basically, what I'm saying is that if you look at the magnitude of the electric field, for, forget the the sign of it right now. If you look at the magnitude of it, at this point, there is no electric field, right? Because there is no, there is no charge. There is no charge. Um, uh, uh, uh what is the right word for it um residual charge right this is uh, charge neutral this is charge neutral but this is not this is called depleted of the charge so so if i start from here there is no electric field in this area right this is charge neutral yes sir there is no current flowing through it so it is it is charge neutral okay now you might ask like how come then the example i was giving you know in a n plus i applied a voltage here and uh, the electric field was uh, constant well that's because i did not have this here i just had a resistor right now i have a capacitor in between so this is like the n resistor this is like the p resistor this is your depletion cap right so there is no current flowing which means that there is no potential drop across this that means there's no electric field right yes sir and for the capacitor it looks like two inverted capacitors right from here to here it looks like a capacitor just like a normal capacitor but 
in a normal capacitor, all the charge is like in a sheet of a metal. Here, they're actually over distance, they're decreasing or increasing. That's why the electric field, instead of being constant, it actually changes over time. Because you can see the number of electric field as I proceed towards the junction, it is increasing. I had one, I had three electric fields still here. I had six electric fields to here, like the diagram I've shown. Obviously, that's a, just a cartoon diagram, but just to give you a flow. Sorry, guys, just one second. I think the battery is running out. Okay. All right. So as I'm I'm actually traversing through this cross section, I just kind of see more and more lines of electric field, right? In case of a capacitor, if you're just looking in case of a capacitor, if I draw a capacitor, uh, I have electric fields going in here. As I'm traveling, I see the same lines of electric fields as I'm traveling. But here, as you can see, the depletion, it is actually changing. That's why it's a nonlinear capacitor, right? So as you're traveling through this, you see more and more lines. And then once you cross the junction, the number of electric files again reduces and goes back to zero because again, there is no current flowing through this. If there is no current flowing through this, there's no potential difference. There's no potential difference. There is no electric field. Under, under, uh, make sense, uh, Shirag? Yes, sir, yes, sir. Okay. All right, so now I'll just quickly, before we start the MOS operation, I'll quickly show how this is biased. Um, so if I take the same PN junction now, and you know, I had, so this is a P type, so I got negative charges, uh, immobile charges here, that was the depletion. Um, and then we had positive charges here and Okay, so by the way, um, you know, I, I said there is about 0.45, uh, sorry, what did I say? 0.7 volt, which appears here. Now, all of you have operated on a diode, like in the lab. Now, if you take a voltmeter, have you ever put it across this and seen a 0.5 volt across it in a voltmeter? So if I just take this, and apply a voltmeter. Will I see 0.5 volts on it? No, sir. Okay, why not? No, we have a potential difference, why don't we see it? Anyone? No, potential meter. No, because no electric okay. field is present outside the depletion layer. No electric field is present outside the depletion layer. Uh, but what I'm saying is that I have a potential. So for example, the potential difference here is 0.75. Since there is no potential difference here, if I look at these two ends, it should be 0.75 as well, right? Because just the KVL, apply a KVL from this node to this node, it should sum up to zero, which means that it should show up as 0.75 from here to here as well. Which means that if I show, put point, uh, put a voltmeter, you should see 0.75. Um, the question is, do you see it or not? So there is a potential between the metal contact. No, sir. So that reduces to zero. Who's, who said that? What's, who said uh, there is a contact potential between the probes? Sorry, sorry sir. Sorry. Okay, sorry. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, so what happens is, so you actually, if you put a voltmeter, you'll actually not see it, okay? Now, this is not very intuitive to understand, but uh, what Saurav just said is, when you apply a contact here, uh, there is a potential, contact potential difference between this and this. And when you put a voltmeter, actually they cancel, these two cancel. And they become exactly 0.75. So if you put a voltmeter, you just see zero. So you take a forward bias, a diode, you put your positive voltmeter to the P side, negative to the N side, you'll still see it's zero because they drop across these two contacts, okay? It's not very obvious, but I'll let you think about it. Just go back and think about it, why it happens. And then when we do the VT variation, I'll come back to this as well. 
just to kind of that's probably the most like uneasy part of the you know this whole is like what the contact potential how does it sum up and i can give you some good references as well but search for it you know think about it but for now just uh, uh, just know that if you put a voltmeter actually you'll not measure anything okay okay now if i put so this is p side if i put a positive potential with respect to this um, so what will happen is there is enough positive okay is, Okay, Karthik, I don't know what you're trying to say on the chat window. Oh, my end, what is that? Okay, I think somebody else is controlling your chat window. You mean it? All right, so, um, so yeah, so if you apply a positive potential with respect to this, let's call this VD. Um, so, One got hanged, that's not why. Okay, so, um, so you apply a positive potential with respect to uh, the P from the N side. So what will happen is the, the first, um, almost about that 0.75 volts, you have to fight against this, right? Because you have to fight against the potential to make what's called, the, you know, you hear a lot of flat band voltage. That's what is the flat band voltage. So you basically bend the, you know, potential here. So you apply the voltage to bring this back up again. The reason for that is because you want the conduction band to be at the same potential so that the, the electrons can flow from one side to the other side. Or in a, in a, in a potential language, what has happened is because of this, you have a barrier now, right? Because of this, the, the, uh, the, the electrons cannot flow in this direction or the holes cannot flow in this direction. So what you do is you undo the barrier by applying a positive voltage with respect to this and this. And then once you have undone the barrier, then the, there are enough um, uh, holes here to go and actually recombine with electrons. And this, this side, there is enough electrons from the contact side to flow in here and recombine here as well, okay? And that's how you'll get the, the current flowing from this direction to this direction. Obviously, it's not a one and zero. You have electron flowing in between because you have some, as you're, as you're increasing the concentration of the electron increases in this direction and what happens is this electric field will sweep it from this here to here the holes i mean in electrons in this direction and you start getting current but i think everyone is familiar with this curve by now so if you do this and you know you kind of get this exponential curve where this is almost equal to some uh, saturation current and exponential VD over VT, and this is your KT over Q, which is at room temperature about 25 millivolts, okay? So as you start going above 25 millivolts, it just starts slowly getting to exponential, uh, uh, it starts exponentially rising it, okay? So that's your forward bias uh, current. Now, if you do the opposite, uh, like as I explained uh, last time, if you, uh, if you put a negative voltage with respect to this, now what you're doing is you're actually adding to the built-in potential. So you're actually increasing this depletion, right? So as you increase the voltage, this depletion starts increasing. Okay. So in a way it starts looking like a capacitor because there's no current flowing. So the current ID is almost equal to zero except for a few minority carriers, but you have charge building up and, but, Unlike a capacitor where the charge builds up all on the surface and this remains the same, P of, your distance is actually increasing as you're going, okay, going up and up. So what you have is if I look at the reverse direction, so if I look at um, the reverse voltage, so this is VR going negative, and if I look at the capacitor, so you start with some small signal capacitance and as you increase your reverse bias voltage, go more negative, this capacitance starts decreasing, okay? And this capacitance is given by some capacitance at zero divided by 
one plus this V D by P naught. And I think last time somebody is asking what is this V naught? This is the same contact potential, which is uh, KT over Q times Okay. And in Willisite, this is especially in the finer nodes, this depletion capacitor is one of the major capacitance which actually limits your performance of you know, digital gates or analog amplifiers or whatever it is, because all your source and drains will see as we get to the um, to the through the MOS architecture, they're built from from this. Okay. All right, so that's all I wanted to cover as uh, the sort of, this is sort of the precursor to getting to, uh, to the MOS operation. Any, any questions so far? Anything from the previous? Any questions? Hello, sir. Yes. Sir, I'm not getting that how capacitance decreases with increasing voltage. Okay. All right, Chandan. Uh, yeah, I'll answer. Okay, Prachita, what's what's your question? Oh, yes, sir, that same graphite because... Same question. Okay. Yes, How about sir, you, Sitis? Yes, I think yes, you're yes, asking. Yes. Uh, how we do get the expression of CJ? Okay, so I'll just tell you how it behaves and uh, the expression. You know, you have. It's a little bit more involved where you have to find out the bulk charge, which is uh, Q times CSI times. Uh, NA and so on. Basically, what you're trying to find out is so Q equals to CV, right? So for a given delta V, find out what's the delta Q, and that's your equivalent capacitance. And this delta Q is equal to, you know, whatever is your um, uh, uh, ND. So let's say this is, okay, let me go to the next slide. All right, let me draw this again. This is my P, P plus with some acceptor ion concentration. This is the N type with some donor concentration. And this is the junction. So before I start putting the voltage, I already have some built in voltage, right? So this says positive charges here. Let me draw the 3D one. So this is all positive. This side is negative. Okay. And if I look at uh, this distance here, let's call this Xn, sorry, Xn, let's call this Xp. So it's basically the depletion side Xn, or this is depletion side Xp. So Xn um, equation is, uh, so it's Q, I'll just write the epsilon Si, then as the voltage is increasing, this is increasing. So that's VF and your doping concentration is increasing. This will decrease. So that's divided by the doping concentration. So in case of N, this will be ND. Okay, so that's the, this distance roughly. I think I might be missing some two term there. I think this is two QI, but proportionally this is the same. So two XN. Yeah, I think that's epsilon SI. Okay, so basically what has happened is uh, you get a distance, um, because like I said, you have some concentration ions. I mean, you have a concentration of carriers and because they have a higher energy, they start moving from one direction to the other and they leave a immobile carrier here. And because they leave, 
uh, you leave a mobile carrier and it keeps doing it till this potential is equal to your difference between the Fermi potential, then, then that's when it stops because then the electron energy doesn't have enough energy to uh, go for the barrier. And if you look at this distance, this distance is given by this equation here, 2q times epsilon si, uh, the Fermi potential divided by the, the donor concentration. Uh, you just understand the, the relation between the donor concentration and this length, because what happens is if I need more carriers per unit length, that, that means I need a higher dopant concentration. So as the dopant concentration increasing, this is decreasing, right? Or if I want to find the charge in this area, the charge, let's call this the Q uh, depletion charge or bulk charge, QB, then that's uh, a Q times, that's the electron, um, uh, the charge of a carrier times the dopant concentration times the X, yeah, what did I call it, Xn here. So in other words, whatever is the dopant concentration per unit volume times the length of it times Q gives you the, the, uh, the total charge in this bulk area. Makes sense? Yes, sir. Everyone understands this part, right? So that's what it is given. Now I apply a reverse bias voltage, right? So if I, uh, okay, so if I write, so there is no current passing through it, right? Just the electric field. So let's say this capacitance here, this cap, you know, I showed you before. So this is like a depletion cap and then I have two resistors. Basically, this is the peel resistor. This is the end resistor, right? So now if I want to find the cap, what is the cap? C ox is equal to? What should be the cap? Just at when VR is equal to zero. Q by VBI? Yes, but you know, this is a differential cap. So, uh, so what you want to find out is delta uh, uh, Q equals to CV, right? So delta Q over delta V, right? So whatever delta VR you give, you want to find out what is the delta charge, that will give you this value of this capacitance. But first let's understand why it is, why it is uh, decreasing. Okay, then we can talk about, so a reverse bias means this is negative, this is positive, you give this. So you apply some negative voltage here. Now, once you apply that negative voltage, I want more charge here, right? I want more charges here to build that voltage. So whatever the inbuilt voltage was, on top of that, I apply VR. So I need this, right? And then I need this negative charges here. So previously, let's say I had this capacitance, which is which was, uh, let's say epsilon SI over XP plus XN, right? Correct? This is when I started with CJ naught. Let's call this CJ naught, right? Yes, sir. Now I applied a voltage. Obviously, epsilon SI remains the same, but my distance has increased by some delta X, right? Because this increase, let's say, let's call this some, uh, well, let's call this XP plus delta X plus XN plus delta X, right? Because this side increased by this amount, this side increased by this amount, my epsilon SI remains the same, but now the distance has increased. So is this a smaller cap compared to this or higher cap compared to this? Smaller. Smaller, it's smaller right? So, yes, so CJ is now smaller than CJ naught, right? Yes, sir. So, so that's the line of derivation. So you find out what is the charge now. So you do delta QR, delta VR, VR, and that equation turns out to be this. 
Okay, so as you're increasing VR, CJ is decreasing. And just follow the, the direction of it. It's not very important to, to uh, know exact equation. Okay. Everyone follows still here? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right, so I um, think what we'll do is, we'll, what's the time right now? So 5.30. So let's do one thing. Let's uh, start the, the, the MOS capacitor, how the threshold is formed. We'll at least follow till, uh, you know, I want to show you what the surface potential concept is and you know, how that affects your um, uh, charge formation. And then uh, maybe in the next class, we'll uh, go ahead and derive the entire threshold function because that'll take some time, okay? All right, so just give me a minute here. I'll just switch on. Okay. All right, before we actually look at the, I just add some slides here. Before we look at the MOS structure itself, let's look, let's see why we wanted that MOS structure to begin with. What is the motivation behind it? Just give me a second here. Okay, just give me a second. I need to stop sharing for some reason. This is hung. Oh, okay. So, there was a five minute break. Okay, so looks like I uh, need a five minute break. Okay, let's take a five minute break. So, what is it? 5.37 now. So, let's come at 5.45 and then maybe we'll spend another half hour just to go through the main um, MOS characteristics. It's okay with everyone? Yes, sir. Okay, so let's Hello, join sir. at 5.45. Okay, what I mean is, see, you need three terminals, right? This terminal, we're not doing anything. We apply a voltage and current starts flowing, right? Then I, I have another third terminal. I don't know what to do with it yet. So that's what I'm asking. So I have a P plus material, for example, I apply a voltage and current starts flowing because there's a lot of holes in them and they'll just start flowing in the circuit and I'll get a current. But how do I now make it non-conductive? Like, how do I make this non-conductive? See, in a metal, I can't do anything to make it non-conductive because the free electrons are always there. I can't drive them away, right? But in semiconductor, can I do something to make it non-conductive? So I'll give you a hint. You see this reverse bias diode here? Why is it non-conductive here? Why is this particular device non-conductive? Right, there's no current when it is reverse bias. Why is that so? So more minority carriers in their respective regions. No minority carriers or more minor no, minority more carriers? More minority carriers. No, but the, so here is the thing, right? So let's take the P. There's a lot of holes here, right? They can carry current in this direction, so which is positive. So they can current in this direction. There is no holes here, but once the holes come here, the electrons can flow and recombine here. So the electrons will flow in this direction, the positive holes will flow in direction, and there, there can be current flowing through it. 
if you do the recombination. But what's the main reason why it's not conducting right now? Cell depletion with increases more. Yeah, so this absence is, of free charge. Yeah, absence of free charge in this region, right? And yes, sir. So actually, Chandan, you're right in the sense that if I take this away, even if I take the depletion away, I'll still have problem conducting because this also needs to have more majority carriers. But let's say I fix that. Okay, let's say I make this conductive. The problem is the depletion here, right? This is depleted of carriers. This is depleted of carriers. There's no carriers here. It looks like a capacitor basically. So that I can't, even if I put some holes here, like let's say I do an injection of holes here, I can't, I can't flow any current through it because it's depleted of carriers here, right? So with that hint now, how do I make this non-conductive now, this piece of piece of P plus? I can deplete them of carriers, right? I can deplete them of carriers and then make them non-conductive. And that's how actually the first FET transistors were done. So what they would do is they would put an oxide layer here, put a metal on top of it, and put a voltage which is positive with respect to this. And that would deplete all these carriers because it will try, this electric field will try to find negative carriers. The only way they can find negative carriers is drive these holes away. So it will deplete this area. Once this is depleted, then this current will, this ID will go to almost equal to zero. So actually it's on both sides. You have control on both sides. You apply some V control here, V control here with respect to this substrate and deplete it of carriers, okay? So that's one way to do it. The problem with this is first of all, it's a very slow device. The transition times are very, very slow. And you can't, it's very hard to make planar devices with this. Planar in the sense that I, you have to make everything on one side of the surface. You cannot, you don't have access to this side. In IC design, everything is on the top or everything in the bottom, but you can't have access to both sides. So it's not a good device to do it on both sides as well, okay? So in planar structures, what we do is we take that same P-type material, the P-type material, the two ends, we make it N plus, okay? So lots of electrons here available, lots of electrons here, but none here. So if I apply a voltage now, it's not going to conduct, right? Because, and the other way to look at it is, if you can see it as a diode, um, this is two reverse bias diodes connected like this. So it doesn't matter which way you, even if you swap this voltage, make this positive negative, same problem, right? It won't conduct. So I have a, I have a non-conductor now, right? So I have a way to make it non-conductor. So I take a P type, right? And I put two N plus sides over here. I have a lot of electrons here, a lot of electrons here to conduct, but there is none in this P type. Um, obviously there is al also a built-in potential here with that depletion layer, that's another reason. Um, now, if I want to make it conductive, what do I do? What is a conceptual way of making it conductive? What kind of carrier I need to inject in this P-type? Electrons. Electrons, right? If I somehow, electrons. yeah, somehow if I get electrons in the, this, then I can start conducting the current through this, okay? So for example, if I just have a, even a sheet of electrons here, then I can start conducting this. And that's basically the, the basic principle of, uh, of your MOS device, okay? So next what we're gonna do is we're gonna just look at that, that part of the circuit and see how we're gonna bring that channel with a voltage control. So we, you have some oxide, you have some metal here, so this is metal, you have oxide, and how do we control this to bring a channel? Uh, how, do we, how do we bring a control channel, a, a channel which is uh, dependent on the voltage, okay? So what I'll do is I'll conceptually show you how the structure is done and show you what really decides uh, that channel separation, and then we'll continue it in the next class. Okay, so first thing we do is we start with a metal. Okay, so that's your metal. And then we have a block of 
oxide in this. So that's oxide. I'm obviously exaggerating this. And then now we put instead of another metal, like you would do it in a capacitor, we put. Uh, I think somebody has their microphone on. Can you, Himadri? I think can you please uh, mute your microphone, please? Instead of uh, another metal, uh, we bring in another substrate. So let's say this is a p-type semiconductor. Okay, so that's your metal oxide semiconductor junction. Okay, now forget about doing N plus and conducting and all that. Let's just apply a voltage and see what happens when we apply a voltage across this uh, uh, sandwich here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply a small voltage here. And I'll make this the reference node. So let's call this ground. So this is, let's say, VG. So I apply a VG, right? Now, let's assume the some positive charges get accumulated over here. What, what happens to the positive charges? So this is oxide, right? So you're going to get electric field, like I just said. And it won't stop till it finds a charge. It'll go. And then once it hits a P-type, uh, sorry. Once it hits a P-type, there is no negative carrier, but it can make a negative carrier because there's a hole it can drive away. So it drives the hole away and puts a mobile charge here, right? And then another charge can come in here, do the same thing, right? Another charge can come here, do the same thing. Another charge can come here, do the same thing. Okay. All right, so let's now uh, use some of our uh, results we did from previous. Now, if I want to plot the electric field, so this is electric field strength, and this is the distance x. So from here to here, if I want to plot the electric field, okay. Okay, let's see, somebody. Can somebody guide me on how to draw the electric field? What do I start from here? So basically there are like three sort of, so you start with, you know, x equals to zero here. And let's say I'll call this T ox here. So that's your T ox distance. And this is oxide with some unit capacitance. So what's the electric field going to be inside this? Constant, constant right? Just like a capacitor, constant. it'll be just constant. constant. Okay. Because there is no charge for it to die or go up or go down, right? So it'll be a constant electric field. Okay. And what about in this region? So let's forget about this region now. So what about, so this is your depletion, just like your PN junction, this is your depletion region now, right? Depletion region. Now, what about this, this, this part here? What is the electric field here? Zero. Zero, right? It's zero here. And then obviously this will join in some fashion from here to here. Okay, so that's the electric field. Okay, let's look at the voltage now. So, and what is going to be the voltage in this junction? Okay, where do I start? So I put a voltage VG, let's First call this. Where, where, where does this start from? VG. VG, right? Yes. Sir. Okay. VG. So what? Okay. So from VG from here to T ox. Decrease linearly. Decrease linearly. Correct. Okay. Good. Should it go all the way to zero here or something else? Zero. Something else. So so linearly, right? So from this point, uh, so I'm I'm looking at this interface now. Should I linearly decrease this to zero or some other value? Other value. Okay, some other value. So let's we don't know what that value is. So we're going to linearly decrease that, right? Correct. Okay. Yeah. Now let's take this junction. Next junction is this depletion to p-type. What is the potential here? Constant. Constant. Constant, what value? Mm -hmm. 
threshold no no this we are doing we are doing potential with respect to this node here which is our ground so with respect to that node what is the value here and rest of the the p type material you can assume this is a resistor right this whole thing is a resistor this end is zero and is there a current flowing here right now no okay there is no current flowing here what is the potential here zero no current then voltage will be zero zero correct zero. sorry it keeps changing on me so this will be zero as well right all the all the way and then so it will go from this value to to zero, zero. right and yes. this will follow exactly the way it followed in this depletion I remember in this depletion you had a potential drop because of that band bending it will follow exactly the same equation here as well okay this potential is called your surface potential it's called vs or vs different books will have different numbers okay and this is the crucial potential which you can uh use to create a channel and not that okay now if i lower the potential what happens so let me take another color so let's say vg2 i may lower the potential to vg2 so i start with vg2 right so it'll be again same thing but it will be a lower some lower potential here as well because there's not enough charges also because the potential is lower so it will go linearly till this and then kind of go here what if i increase the potential if i increase the potential to some vg3 let's say vg3 it'll kind of go linearly but it'll go and stick at a higher potential here as well so this will be some phi s2 this will be sorry this will be phi s3 and this was my original phi s okay so the condition for inverting this so what i want is i have n type ones here okay i want n type carriers here the condition for condition for n type is this surface potential phi s should be equal to 2 times the junction potential why 2 pf i'll explain it through the band diagram a little later on but just assume that that's the case so in other words i keep increasing this gate voltage till this voltage here vs becomes equal to 2 vf and 2 vf is basically the the fermi potential for this p type okay so i should call it probably 2 fp why 2 fp i'll explain in a little bit later but that's the potential you need to convert this p type into n type and then i'll get free n carriers and then i can put n plus in this area n plus in this area apply a voltage across this and control it and if i want to switch it off i lower the voltage to a value less than that value where this phi s is less than 2 phi f sorry one second phi s is less than 2 phi fp and then this channel will turn off again you'll have only depletion area okay and like i said i'll explain it a little bit later through the band diagram but just assume that this is the condition given to you so semiconductor theory tells you this and you're done so now the question is what is the vg value what is the vg value for which for which uh phi s is equal to 2 phi f who can say what's the vgs value so a simple way to find that is you can apply All right so let me just redraw this again
So KVL is applicable everywhere. So I'm going to apply KVL in this loop here. So let's call this voltage V oxide. And obviously this voltage is Phi S, right? Okay, now tell me applying KVL, what should be, sorry, this is VG. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Looks like somebody cannot, Kritika cannot hear me. Can you guys all hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, so just give me a second. Stellar. Your side, probably off speaker. Okay, so apply KVL now and tell me. So, so uh, so this is VG. So what's VG? If you apply in that loop. Vox yeah. Vx, Vox plus Vs, right? And what do I need uh, Vs to be to invert it? Uh, two Vp. Two Vip, right? So I'll put two Fp here. Okay. So now the question is, what's Vox? Epsilon Ox by Vox. Epsilon Siox by T O X. T O X. Yeah, that is C O X. But what is V O X? <laughs> okay, so I mean you're in the right direction. So C O X is epsilon. Sorry, epsilon O X by T O X, which is correct. So that's C O X. So what's V O X? Q so equals Q to into epsilon X. Sorry, I couldn't hear you. Epsilon O X by Q T O X. Q O X will be my. So Q equals to C V, right? So V is Q over C. So you want to find out the charge by C ox, right? But the question is, what is this charge? This charge is actually all this ball charge which build up just before the channel got inverted, right? Because before the channel got inverted, this charge has to match this charge, correct? Yes, sir. So that means if I know what that charge is, so I, I wouldn't say that's Q ox, I'll call it Q depletion, okay? And then if I divide it by the C ox, well, that's not exactly true because you have this length too, but approximately we can write this, okay? And we found out how to uh, calculate Q depletion from our earlier uh, PN junction theory. So you can write here. So I'm going to just write Q depletion over C ox here. C ox here plus two Phi F. Okay, so this is what's called the threshold voltage ideal. Okay, I'll explain it in a little bit why it's called ideal. So if I call this voltage VG equals to this value, so VTN ideal, is equal to whatever is the depletion charge required before the phi s goes to phi f by c ox plus two phi f because that's what I want my surface potential to be. When the Vg is equal to this voltage, the channel will turn on, okay? But there is a catch. The catch is, you remember we discussed about the contact potential. So we have to overcome another quantity. And that quantity is, so I'm going to actually take a real metal now, which in IC design, we actually use polysilicon. So poly, we just call it poly. That behaves like a material. So we have oxide, oxide here, and then we have the semiconductor, right? So this is your P sub. You know how I said, when you have a N, you have a P type. And if I look, 
here there is a potential let's call this potential built in potential bi and you know you calculate it to kt over sorry kt over q times ln n and d and all that right so you can keep doing this for a series of stacked materials as well so if it is a series so let's uh so let's say i have some material m1 m2 m3 m4 and so on if i take a stack and let's say i want to find out what's this built in or what's called the contact potential so so a lot of times you'll see it's called contact potential or built in potential built in potential if you look at this built in potential it's actually the built in potential of m1 m2 okay let me just say phi m1 m2 plus phi m2 m3 plus phi m3 m4 and if you do it by what's called their work function which is phi m1 m2 phi m2 m phi m1 minus m2 m3 and so on this will actually result as phi m1 m1 m4 okay the work function i'll show a little band diagram uh, maybe the next class but i'll tell you what the gist of this is basically it tells you doesn't matter what stack you have over here the built in potential i see across this is always the built in potential of these two end guys okay so for example if this was uh, p plus this was p then this will be a b potential of p plus p if this was a p this was a n this will be built in potential of p plus n if this was uh, just metal uh, and n then this will be a built in potential of metal and n okay like i said this is a little bit of it's not very intuitive i'll i'll maybe go through it again with the band diagrams uh, in the next class but Uh, what i'm trying to show here is before you apply any charge or anything this stack which uh, so this was your metal which i've converted into poly if i just look at the 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 potential across this without any voltage anything just like a pn diode you have a potential of the poly or i'll call it metal in this case and the semiconductor which is the substrate the oxide is out of that picture okay and this is called the work function difference and i'll explain later maybe what the work function difference is and so what it means is that just like you know for example in the diode case like in the forward bias diode case right there was this built in potential so when i applied the voltage first i had to overcome this before i can start conducting the current so same here in this case let's say the phi s was a negative potential phi ms before i can do anything at all i need to apply a voltage positive voltage which is equal to v we call it the flat band voltage is equal to this phi ms the contact potential before all this calculation starts what i have shown you here assuming that i have overcome that potential if i hadn't overcome that potential i have to add that um add that here okay so in other words my vtn which is the definition of it is vg when the channel inverts so the channel inverts in the sense uh the p type becomes n type so this was a p type this was a p type with hole shear okay so first it got depleted and then once i reach that voltage vtn this is a channel of electrons which looks like an inductor and the reason we use this quantity is basically uh, so let's say this was doped with some acceptor ions n right so then the hole concentration is equal to this na 
during this inversion uh, voltage, this electron concentration almost becomes to the same as the whole concentration. That's why it's called the inversion of the channel. So for this inversion of the channel, whatever value I need to first deplete the channel, that value, plus I need that two phi F value, plus I need the metal semiconductor junction potential. There is another term here, which is there are some impurities. So if you don't understand this part, it's fine. Basically, there are some impurities ions actually in the oxide, which should not be there. In order to overcome that, plus uh, in the interfaces as well, because these clean interfaces are very difficult to fabricate. So that by C ox, that charge I have to overcome. So I have to overcome the depletion charge. I have to invert uh, the band diagram from P type to N type. I have to overcome the contact potential. I have to overcome all the uh, impurities and then it will actually invert the channel and that's the VT. Now, if I just take a P sub oxide and a poly, this actually turns out, we'll do an example next time. This actually turns out to be a negative voltage. Like it'll turn out to be like minus 0.2 volts or something like that. We'll do an example. Now, this is what's called an enhancement device. Uh, sorry, depletion uh, enhancement mode device. Enhancement, sorry, enhancement mode device. All it means is VT is negative, VT is negative, okay? Now the problem with this is uh, typically in IC design, we do battery operated or whatever voltage is with reference to ground. If you want VT equals to negative, then you need dual supplies. So you will need like VDD, then you'll need minus VDD, then your ground will be somewhere in between. And typically we don't need, want that. So if you don't want that, you want this VT to be positive quantity, to be a positive quantity. If you want to a positive quantity, so what people do, or what is done actually, they actually put uh, positive carrier implants in this, in this um, region. So then you have another term, which is Q, sorry, I shouldn't say IMP here confuses you. I would say Q uh, unwanted, right? Say UW or something like that. UW. So this will be Q implant, whatever you have implant by Seox. And this quantity is what you control. I mean, the foundry house controls to make the VT whatever you need. So for example, let's say the VT came out to be this quantity, came out to be minus 0.1 volts, okay? And uh, as a designer, I or as a designer, or let's say the market demands like, no, no, I want at least a VT of one volt. Then they implant this such that this quantity is 1.1 volts so that this entire thing is one volt, then I get a positive, positive uh, quantity VTN. Uh, okay, I'll stop here and ask like, did this make sense or some place where just like absolutely did make sense or somewhat made sense? Any questions here? Q unwanted uh, term, can you explain again? Say that again? Uh, unwanted charge of CUX. I explain that. What you mean? What what do I, what what does it mean? So what is this again? Yeah. So that is so so far all the explanations I was doing, it was assuming it's an ideal oxide, ideal poly, ideal piece of and all that. But what happens is during the uh, fabrication, some charges actually get into oxide. So like maybe some negative charges got into oxide. Uh, some, uh, and then there are uh, uh, negative charges in the interface itself, in this interface itself. So what it means is when I'm applying it, so you know how I said, um, you know, the, these things go and end here, the electric field go and end here, right? As a negative charge, but actually there are charges here. So what will happen is they'll actually end here. So I have to first overcome that before I send this depletion uh, to a value which is QB over C ox. And we'll, I'll show you some calculation values next time to give you a feel of the values uh, you get. 
And so you have to first overcome these impurity charges in the oxide interface as well as inside the oxide itself. So I keep saying, right, there are no charges inside the oxide. In reality, that's not true. So when they actually create oxide, uh, usually sodium ions get trapped inside the oxide. So you actually have a charge there. Uh, but you can ignore this part. You know, if you don't understand, this is a very small part actually, you can ignore it. The main quantities are this. Basically, you have to uh, deplete the channel till phi S is equal to 2 phi F, and you want to make that phi S equals to 2 phi F, then overcome the contact potential, which is uh, totally dependent on the metal type. So this is dependent on how well you dope the, uh, not how well, but how you doped uh, the P substrate. So if your Na is higher, then this Q depletion will be higher. If your Na is smaller, this Q depletion will be smaller. 2 phi F is, again, depends on the doping of the profile. So this could be anywhere from 0.6 to 0.8 volts. Uh, phi MS is a function of, again, this is a physical quantity function of uh, work function difference between the poly and so you don't. This is something which is controlled by the foundry house. They actually implant it to control this voltage. So, so if the market is demanding, no, 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 one volt is too high, I want 0.5 volts, uh, they will implant it such a way that uh, it is 0.5 volts. So when you start designing, you'll see different standard cell libraries like LVT, HVT, High, uh, high VT transistors, low VT transistors. So that's, uh, that's what it means. Uh, it means those standard cells are using transistors whose VT is low, or those standard cells are using high VT uh, standard cells means uh, the standard cells are using a higher VT and so on. Okay. Uh, so did that, did that make sense so far? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, any, any questions uh, so far? So like I said, I just wanted to introduce you to you how we are forming the channel in that thing. And then next time I'll explain to you why 2 phi f because just to give you an idea, just a quick idea. Uh, so P type, right? So let's draw the band diagram of P type. So P type, this is EV, this is EC, and this is your Fermi level of the intrinsic semiconductor and this is your real Fermi level, right? So let's call this EFP. So this is, <coughs> sorry, phi FN, right? If I want to okay. convert this, sorry, P, phi FP. If I want to convert this to a same to a n type with exactly the same carrier concentration where should be the fermi level so this is a p type so let's say i'm going to overlay i'm going i'm asking you now let's say i wanted a n type okay with the same electron concentration as the concentration of this particular material P type, which is Na or uh, the holes, if I want this, where should this Fermi level exist? Near to the conduction near, band. Right, near to the conduction near to the band. Conduction band. Yeah, correct, the near to the conduction band. And how high should it be from EFI so that- Phi it F Phi F Phi, Exactly, Phi F P, right? Phi F P. So that's exactly why we need two phi FP because we are actually trying to bend the band from here to here and that requires a potential of two phi FP. Make sense? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. And I'll draw the band diagram at the interface next time and it'll be you know a little bit more clear. I think I showed you last class, I'll show it again. Okay. Okay. So just to kind of quickly summarize, so this VT, like as I said, um, uh, so if I write the VT equation again, so VTN, this is equal to Q depletion over C ox plus two phi F plus um, the contact potential, forget the impurities for now, and uh, the implant, how much Q is implanted over C ox. Okay, so that's it. So, um, so all this, the foundry can control, but very little. This is what the foundry controls to do it. But whatever they do, once they design it, 
the designer has no control over it okay and all this is also a function of temperature this vtn is also a function of temperature because this is dependent on nd and that's a function of temperature this is function of nd this is a function of temperature as well okay function this is also a function of temperature and obviously this is a function of temperature as well so vtn is a function of so vtn usually decreases with increasing temperature so the designer has no control on this part except for the body bias and i'll explain the body bias i think next time like how do we change the change the vt of a device changing the substrate bias so essentially what it is is you actually apply a voltage here if you apply the voltage here then this surface potential will go higher then i need a higher voltage to bring it back to that previous surface potential okay i'll explain that uh, next time okay makes sense guys or uh, any any questions so far um, so that uh, vt is control uh, can't we do it uh, by controlling the temperature uh yeah that's a good question so the question is can can't we use by controlling temperature but uh typically that's not under your control right so for example when i design a chip it's actually the other way around uh, when i design a chip so for example if you are a designing a chip for a consumer items so for example uh, cell phone is a consumer device so if i want to design for a consumer device then um, i need to operate exactly as the data sheet says for consumer di uh, device from minus 20 degrees centigrade to 85 degrees centigrade sometimes minus 48 if it is a industrial application then this is usually minus 40 degrees c to 125 degrees c so in fact it's the other way around uh, the other way around what i mean is when the temperature changes the vt changes uh so when we start designing circuits we have to make sure either through circuit level or any other level to make sure that uh um uh, the circuit behavior is still within what has been spec by the spec set okay did that answer your yes, question sir. Yes, sir. yes sir okay and okay there's some questions on the chat window let me check Okay. Uh, all right, Manit. Okay, I think that's it um, for today. Um, hopefully, this gave you an idea of. So we actually started with uh, you know how electric field behaves differently in different types of materials uh, uh, because of the electric field, how the potential changes, and then we showed you just the p-n junction. um how it's a reverse bias capacitance or how it's a forward bias junction and from that we try to create this switch uh, actually we started with the motivation behind doing this uh, device to create a switch so that we can create digital devices um and uh, and this is so the first thing you have to do is you have to control a channel like control a conducting channel based on a control voltage and that's what we just showed you that Uh, if you take a, a metal oxide semiconductor uh, sandwich and you increase the voltage by certain amount then as a channel turns on uh, yes subham go ahead what's the, what's the question sir in the chat box sorry you you broke up what's the question sir please check the chat box oh sorry the chat box Okay any any other question guys Okay so if you have uh, no other questions uh, we'll stop here Okay Subham you have another question Okay Okay then we'll stop here and uh, we'll continue this again next monday and uh, again uh, punit will have his class on wednesday friday as usual um, and then we'll continue with this uh, cmos topic on monday okay okay okay, okay thank sir. you thank you all and bye have thank a good you, night thank you. Yeah. thank you sir thank, thank you. you sir thank you
Thank you, sir. Thank you.